We start this morning with a subject that has been weighing very heavily on all of us since the horrific events in Las Vegas just over a week ago. Gun control is a polarizing and emotional debate that is more important than ever to address. Joining us now to discuss what can be done, please welcome Michigan Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, Carolyn Everson, and Fortune's Nina Easton. Good morning, everyone. Did everyone have a great time last night? How awesome was that? Oh my god. That was pretty amazing. Um, we're going to start on, a, on a, a dark note. I, I realize that. But hopefully, we'll have some uplifting thoughts along the way. We're actually going to start personal this morning. Um, because we all, all three of us, come to this with a, um, a very personal bent. And I'm going to start with mine. Um, my, um, my, ne my nephew's uh, best friend was killed at Virginia Tech. My older son was at Fort Hood when that shooting occurred, distant. But the worst one for me was at UC Santa Barbara in May, a couple years ago, in which a shooter came up. He hated women. He hated sorority girls in particular. And he decided to target my son's girlfriend's sorority. Uh, he came in, he knocked on the door, and for some reason, one of the girls just decided not to open the door, even though he looked like a normal college kid. He could have gone in there and shot up every girl standing in that hall, every young woman standing in that hall. Thank God she didn't open the door. But he decided to let loose on the students, young students, on the lawn of that sorority, um, one of whom was killed, one of whom was injured. Six students were killed during that rampage. That could have been my son standing on that lawn. He happened to be a block away at the time. And since then, I've been, um, and some of my views will come out during this discussion, it's been something that it, 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 you realize how much it touches you, all of us so personally. Um, it's gotten so bad that if I have those three incidents in my life, I think, I think it's just uh, in, indicative of the scope of what we're facing today. I want to turn first to Debbie, because you have your own personal experience on the gun front. Share that. So um, I'm very complicated on guns. Uh, in the interest of fallen public disclosure, which Robert Draper reminded the world last week in the New York Times, 
The man that I'm married to uh, was on the board of the National Rifle Association. Remind everyone who you're married to. I'm married to John Dingle. Uh, Former congressman. Uh, who was in the Congress for a very long time, uh, but was very active in the NRA and, quite frankly, one of the founders of the lobbying arm. And it is the one subject that he and I, uh, I use the word violently, disagree, but it's not even a good word right now. Uh, but I had, I'm, and he is a very responsible gun owner. Uh, he grew up outdoors, hunting and fishing, and you know we could talk about that forever. Uh, but I grew up in a home. I gave a speech last year on the House floor, not planning on it. Uh, it was really just from my heart. I had spoken a little about it before, but not in detail because my mother is still alive. And I come from a generation that what happened in the home stayed in the home. And I had a father that was uh, very volatile, was on opioid drugs before anybody understood what that was and could snap like that. And I knew what it was like to be in a house where guns were accessible and he might try to use that gun and did and tried to grab that gun from him, my mother running out of the house, us hiding in the closet. It's unfortunately happened more than once, and praying to God that we'd be okay. The police wouldn't come. You know, I called the police that night, and we were the house on the hill. Nobody believed these kinds of things in those days. I have spent my entire adult career trying to figure out how do we keep guns out of the hands of those that shouldn't have guns? How do we deal with those that have mental illness? And I think while we're all worried about mass shootings, more than 60% of the suicides in this country are done by guns. 90 people are dying a day. So why what happened in Las Vegas horrifies us and captures us, as do all of these others. We've got a problem that's happening every day. And there are two sides to it. And it's very complicated. And because it's complicated, we never get an answer. Yeah. Nobody will go to the table and have the discussion we need to have. And Carolyn, you're trying to initiate the discussion. Um, and you come to it as a mom and an executive. Go ahead. So I'm here um, as a mom, first and foremost, um, but also as um, from a female and woman perspective. When Sandy Hook happened in 2012, my twin daughters were nine years old. They're now 14. Uh, a high school student I went to school with was killed in Las Vegas um, last Sunday. But I don't have necessarily the personal experience, and yet I'm reminded by Kristen Lemkow, who really was the genesis of me getting involved in this a couple of years ago, by a mother when Kristen approached her after Sandy Hook, and Kristen said what probably all of us would say, I can't imagine what you're going through. And the mother looked at Kristen and said, I need you to imagine what we're all going through. I need you to imagine if your child was in that school because we need to get to a sensible place in this country where both sides can agree on what, frankly, the majority of the population agrees on. And so after what happened in Las Vegas, Kristen and I and several other women jumped in together, along with a few of our uh, male colleagues in the industry, and said, what can we do between a marketing and business and advertising to change what culture believes in this issue? We've done it with LGBT, we've done it with gay marriage, we're working on it with bullying. How can we change the dialogue and get both sides, which are very entrenched in their positions, to at least agree on things that the majority of Americans agree on? And we're pushing forth two, what we think are two reasonable positions. One is to just reduce and get rid of all the loopholes with universal background checks. Because today, even though there are background checks that are federally mandated if you buy a gun in a, um, a federal store, even like a Walmart, the truth of the matter is 40% of gun sales are done privately at gun shows or online. And we want all universal background checks to be conducted. Seems simple, but it's not what's taking place in the majority of states. 
And the second thing for gun owners that are, that do legally own guns, we're asking that they be kept safe in the home. Today there are 1.7 million guns estimated in the home that are kept in a not safe environment. Meaning at the end of today when we all go home, there will have been 13 veterans that have taken their life in their home through guns. There will be seven children that have died through guns. And our population in America, we're 4.2% of the global population and we own 42% of the guns worldwide. We have a major problem on our hands, and this is a female issue for domestic abuse. A woman in a home with a man that has a gun is five times more likely to be shot. There will be women that will be killed today for domestic abuse. It's a veteran issue. It's a parent issue. And I, at the end of the day, I'm here not as an executive of a company. I'm here as a human and a person who cares about this issue because at the end of the day, no one is gonna care about how much revenue I ran at Facebook. But I hope that somebody will care about the legacy that I and others in this room, and certainly with Congresswoman Debbie, that we actually make a difference once and for all and put some sensible gun laws in effect. And so that's why I'm here And you today. have a petition online to check out. I have a petition with Kristen out. Lemkow and Linda Boff and Lisa Licht and a number of women that have been very, very supportive and we'll put it onto the app and we could use all of your help. It's not about the number of signatures. I was very focused on that, but we could have millions of signatures and yet we are still at a place where both sides can't agree because this is a, for the people that are staunch Second Amendment believers, they believe guns are a set of freedom. Um, it's almost a God-given right. And I don't think we're gonna be changing any time soon the opinions on the Second Amendment. And yet, if you go on the way on the other side, any measure to try to prevent gun ownership is being shot down. So what can we do? We think we can get to some sensible laws that can protect humans. It may not prevent what happened in Las Vegas, I'm not here to tell you that our universal background checks or keeping a gun home is safe in the home that would have prevented what happened. But if we can do something to prevent the 33,000 people that are dying every year because of guns, then I think that is an obligation we all have something to do So on. let's talk about the politics of this. Debbie put on your politician's hat, your member of Congress hat. Um, Sandy Hook, I was on air that weekend and we were all convinced that this was a game changer that we were going to see major legislation come out of this, and we did. It didn't come out, but we, and we had um, a bipartisan compromise to expand um, background checks, a ban on assault weapons, a ban on high capacity gun magazines, which I, I think the latter two are especially also critical, particularly in, in mass shootings. Um, all of those went down in the Senate. They were unable to get 60 votes needed to pass. What is your sense of the politics in Congress today? I think it's very hard to get anything through. There's a, well, well, we probably won't even get the bump legislation, even though even the NRA says we should have the bump legislation, but people have a way with the legislative process of adding other things onto the bump legislation that makes it toxic, which will get it killed in the Senate. There's very common sense legislation that's been introduced by Peter, K there are two bipartisan bills. One is Peter King and Mike Thompson's, which does the background checks. I have the other bipartisan bill with Dan Donovan, which is a simple, it's like the bump. If you've been convicted of stalking with a gun, you can't carry a gun. Or if you've been a, a, of a dating partner, or if you've... Uh, How about if you're a terrorist? Well, <laughs> the, I mean, we can't get them to go to yeah. the table. You know, there's, I, you can get into the whole discussion. One of the pieces of legislation we want to say is that if you're on the no-fly list that you can't have a gun, but the no-fly list has all of its own constitutional problems, which, so you can't get anybody to the table. We make everything so complicated that we can't do anything simple. But and let me just, women, isn't just, did you hear what she just, we can't even get people on the no-fly list to not legally buy guns. It is, it is literally harder to buy over-the-counter cold medication than it is to buy a gun. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. And, you know, I mean, it's, that is one of the problems. That's why we need women. We need women to become organized and to help. It's going to happen at the grassroots level. You know, I um, remember when the assault weapons ban bill passed in 
I probably was very critical in what happened because the White House didn't know what was happening, and I called them and said, you've got a problem, and I'll never forget that night. I thought John Dingell and Chuck Schumer were like having this huge fight about magazines, and I was thinking Fortune Time Magazine. I didn't know what they were talking about, and said, why are they fighting about magazines? Uh, but I also think we lost the Congress because of the bill that passed that day. John Dingell resigned from the NRA. Uh, he voted for the assault weapons ban, not happily, and I'm very proud of that. I'll take credit for that. NRA hates me to this day, and I wear that too as a... Um, but uh, when we went home after that vote, John had death threats. We had protesters. We had to have police protection for six months because he voted for that assault weapons ban. Now, I was worried about what was going to happen to me. I, gave, I had not intended to speak. I was sitting on the floor when we had the sit-in. I had not intended to speak. And I, I have no idea. When I went, I simply spoke from my heart. And I was scared to go home. I didn't know. I have a very complicated district. I love my district. But it's got some very, very strong second amenders. And when I went home to the same places I had gone with him in 1995, John Dingle's son, who was also an avid hunter, would not speak to his father for six months after that 1995 vote. That's how strong the, the feelings are out there. Um, and I had women come up to me at the Trenton Street Festival and thank me for my courage. People need to know you care. People, we need to be a voice that counters the other side. The other side's strong. You have 30 seconds to one last thought. The, the biggest myth that needs to be busted is for people thinking that having a gun in the home makes you safer. For every one gun that is used to protect someone in their home, 34 innocent people are killed in a day, 78 people will commit suicide, and two children will have an accidental death. So even if you believe in owning a gun, I will respect that, and I'm not going to get into a debate about the Second Amendment, but please, if you're a mother or if you know people in your neighborhood that have guns, ask the question, is the gun locked up? Do not send your children to homes where guns are not right. locked up. You do not want to be a, in, a, in a statistic in this. And we need everyone to stop the myths that have been put out there by propaganda and marketing, and we need to, as an industry, and women in particular, take this on. And this should be the legacy that we leave a country that's safer for the children that are coming up. Thank you us. so much. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much. All right. So Boeing recently announced a reorganization of its defense group via a three-part strategy, consolidation of sites, a move of headquarters to Washington, D.C., and a focus around agility. Heading up these changes within the world's third largest defense contractor is a woman who's number 30 on the MPW uh, list. Please welcome Leanne Carrot. <laughs> so this is Leanne's first time at MPW. What are you thinking? How oh do you like God. it? I am overwhelmed. I did not know what I was missing. And last night we had the opportunity to see all the young ladies and their career aspirations. And I heard the two call outs to be the director of NASA. And that was Awesome. Oh, yeah, that's right. How cool I forgot is about that. that, that and we love that was... rocket scientists, so that's yeah. just great. Yeah. And so I want to say hashtag girl power. I think that's just, you know, what we should be doing. That's fabulous. So you're kind of a space baby. Um, I am. Why do you call yourself that? So my mom and dad met uh, in our Michou factory down in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, where we were building the Saturn V rocket. And then they went when you say we, Boeing. You're a we, Boeing baby. I am Boeing second generation, exactly. Yes. Um, and then they moved over to Kennedy Space Center as you know the Apollo program continued to evolve. And I was born right outside Kennedy uh, Space Center. And my whole life has been Boeing. What's really exciting, and I was on the phone with my dad the other day. I was down there because today, in the very factory my folks met in, we're building the largest rocket that's going to take us to Mars. And how ironic is that? that is so ironic. I called Dad and I said, he said, what are you up to? I said, I've been down in New Orleans. And he goes, what are you doing down there? I said, Daddy, we're building the largest rocket. We're going to, and where we're was going to Mars. He's like, 
really? He goes, that's really cool. So that was great. And that's going to be a manned. Um, well, it'll start yeah, out, you know, they'll be unmanned. Yeah, it'll start, everything, you know, we progress, similar to what we did decades ago, we'll progress through unmanned um, to manned, man being men and women. So we're very, yeah. we're we very. We have to come up with a new word for that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Leanne actually came up with a word about, um, you had Marilyn Houston here, who you're very friendly with, but yeah, you're also she's a competitor. Awesome. But you call it, what do you call it? Coopetition. Coopetition the between the defense folks. It is. Yeah. The defense industry is really tight knit. Uh, you saw Secretary Wilson on the stage yesterday. She's absolutely fabulous. Um, but because we are a tight knit industry, one also that is very much focused on the men and women who fight and serve and protect all of us. We compete, but we cooperate, and we cooperate more than we compete. Because we, you're working on the same project. A lot of times we're working on the same projects, and we know how hard this business is. Yeah. Was it hard for you? Um, you've kind of like rose, you rose up the ladder. Um, you told me you were surprised that you got this job. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. It's amazing what other people see in you before you see it in yourself. Um, and I have, I'm almost 30 years with the company now and have had a wide, wide array of roles from profit and loss to being the CFO on the defense side of the business. But literally the day that they, um, our chairman and CEO, Dennis Molenberg, asked for me to take the role, I, I was taken back. You thought, he, you thought he was going to fire you. I really did. It was one of those moments <laughs> where we're having a meeting. Now, you all know what I mean. You're having a meeting. It's kind of unexpected. Um, the head of um, our HR, Human Resources, was there, Heidi Capozzi. She's absolutely fabulous. Um, and she's patting me on the arm saying, it's all going to be great. And I am thinking to myself, and they're shutting the door. I'm like, <laughs> Uh, so it was, he just Who's looked, had an experience I mean, like that, where you thought you were like, like bad news was coming, <laughs> but it was really good news, right? I, I think one of the things that um, I love about uh, women in leadership is we are used to having good days and we're used to having bad days, but it's all about how we start out the next day. It's always about the day after and how you make sure you handle it right the next time. So Boeing is this interesting company that you have the commercial side, which yeah. is all of our airplanes that we fly on, and then you run the defense, the defense and side. space. Um, and defense and space has actually gotten more important since 9-11. Explain the dynamics of the company post 9-11. Well, one of the uh, very, very uh, historical, you'll see averages that show that as a nation and as a world is thriving and there's less fear, you know, or just world economies, uh, you'll see commercial airline travel increase. And with commercial airline travel increasing, you see uh, more airline sales. When you see that there's more, uh, let's say, crises or threats in the environment, traditionally what you've seen is that part of the business have a cycle effect, and on the defense side, you see an upturn. And so uh, 20 years ago, the company decided uh, to make certain that we could write out any of those cycles. And from a workforce perspective, that's really important because we can move people between our defense and our commercial side of the business because of all those great technology. Yeah. Now, in most recent years, because we are operating in such a global environment, you don't see that historical trend. You don't see that cycle effect, especially on our commercial side. It continues to grow. And as we're entering new markets, such as China and others, yeah. you see that. But it was really one of the key elements of the strategy in terms of making certain that we have, were a company that could continue to endure over the long haul. And I have to give credit to our leaders at the time. Uh, we're entering our second century right now. We just celebrated our 100th anniversary Congratulations. last year. So that's, it's that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and you're also at the, uh, like all, a lot of these aerospace companies, at the cutting edge of innovation. Um, I interviewed your CIO. I was telling you this. Uh, we're, let's talk about autonomous yes. um, vehicles and in space and so on. So I was, I was interviewing him um, about uh, about technology, and um, and I said, so I, let me get this right. So we're going to have airliners that have um, that are flown by themselves, right? Autonomous vehicles, autonomous. so to speak. And I said, but there'll be a pilot there, kind of watching things, right? And he said. <laughs> That's one scenario. <laughs> well, Mary said it, I think, um, brilliantly yesterday as she was talking about uh, cars, autonomous cars. Yeah. This technology is not new. We have been evolving it. It's specifically on the defense side. So I'll share with you a, a story. A few years back, a mom called me, literally called me out of the blue, to thank us for building helicopters. 
and her son had been um, severely injured in a um, IED incident um, where he needed to be medevaced out and then brought back to the U.S. She called me to say thank you for my son coming home for Christmas. She said, I want to thank you and your team for what you do. My son came home for Christmas because of what you do. Where autonomy really strikes at the heart on the defense side is any time that we don't have to put a man, man or woman in harm's way, that's what we want to do. And you all have seen the progress on the robotics in terms of uh, little vehicles that go in and check whether um, there is a potential threat in a, in a potential building. Right. You've seen it with vehicles. Um, Mary was sharing that yesterday. And you see the drone technology and larger aircraft. And as we were talking about, optionally manned. Yeah, uh, where optionally you can, manned is what we're calling manned, it now. Where yeah. you can have uh, someone in the seat or not. Um, and this is, this is a great way to make certain that our, you know, those men and women on the front line have every chance to come home. Please um, raise your hands if you have a question, because I'm going to get, get you. I'm going to ask one more question before we, while the mic gets to you. You seem to think that we're just going to be traveling to the moon for vacation and then on to Mars. I like, do. Okay. You want to go with me? Oh, fun. <laughs> No, I have to tell I you. There's not so, there at the no, no. There aren't like nice beaches. Or... So I have to tell you, I'm probably, you know, the moon would be easier than Mars because it takes you so long to get to Mars and back. You, you know, it depends on how old we are. How long would it take us time. to get to Mars? I can't remember the exact statistic. It's a couple of, it's a couple of years. Years. Yeah. yeah it takes a bit. <laughs> it takes a bit of time. So you have to be really paid up on your, you know, your mortgage. You got to have things like kind of worked out before you leave. It's not just, oh, I'll just email yeah. them. It'll be fine. I'd love that. <laughs> Question. T share, share who you are. Oh, uh, Jenny Johnson and Franklin Templeton. Um, so on your question, or your description of the commercial business versus national security and defense, how do you balance as a public company expanding in markets where perhaps some of that technology can't be, you're, you're fearful of it being disclosed? So as you said, you can switch people between the commercial airline business and the defense side, right. and you move into places like China and others. How do you balance that? Well, there are clearly some areas from a national security perspective that, from a defense perspective, we're not going to move into those markets. I have not been to China um, with my clearance, security clearances and all that is involved in the world I live in. That's not a, that's not a possibility. But we will work with the State Department, and as those countries reach out and ask for technology, there is a thorough review and examination and what's uh, decided then to be released, and that's what we call it releasability. Now, in terms of basic technology, such as autonomy, um, or let's say uh, cyber and digital analytics, there is a lot of progress that's been made over the years on the defense side of the business where we can take those learnings and apply it to the commercial space. And so that's how we really look at it, is where are those opportunities to take some of those core technologies and expand? Questions? So, so talk, about, talk about more cyber um, and what your concerns are on that front. So it was really interesting. Uh, we, uh, you know, we are constantly being surveyed, surveyed, and we understand that. And I think as a population, surveyed. we are surveilled. Surveilled. Sur and well, we may be surveyed, too. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> surveilled. Um, and uh, we recognize that there's a significant, there are threat environments that we need to be um, understanding and how we work depending on what defense industry, what, what defense company you're in, how you partner with the government on that. So we have uh, uh, analysts who can help look at data. Uh, we also look at applications for satellites in terms of what some of those, how do we make certain that we have resilience so that if somebody were to try to take out something on our side, right. Uh, there is redundant technology available so that those data continue to be provided to the U.S. government. Um, but what we want to make certain of is we understand what those threats are and we want to understand where those um, openings are where people could come in and place whatever it is at yeah. risk so that we can block and protect. Describe, the, in terms of national security, describe the satellite landscape. So many people don't realize that our great phones that we all use that, you know, 
cue us up, tell us where to go, all the different things. It's all being done via satellites. Right. Um, and there was a great panel last week with the National Space Council that Vice President Pence shared where they actually talked about having the resilience and how much of our technology and all of our daily world revolves around satellite capabilities. Which is kind of scary on one level, yeah. It is if you, as, if as you, well as if, exactly. But you have to know, that goes back to that threat environment. Right. How do we make certain that there is the right resilience and redundancy out there so that it's protected yeah. um, and it's understood? And that's what we want. We want assured space. And do we, do you feel like we have it? I mean, the, the, the concern that's always raised is China in space. Uh, rules of engagement, and you heard Secretary Wilson make mention about having rules of engagement, whether it is uh, dealing with uh, North Korea or any other uh, complex situation. Same thing with rules um, in space. Leanne, this has been a fabulous conversation. One last piece of advice to this crowd on leadership as you've moved up the Boeing ladder? I was told uh, once that I smile too much uh, that I laughed too much, that I seemed to have just too much fun to be in management. You do. I mean, it's like I was shocked when I met and, you. And, <laughs> and I have to share, as I sit here today, I think I'm going to laugh. I think it's pretty good. Don't lose who you are. I mean, I think that's what makes us all so, that's what makes us all so special, and it's what makes our business so incredible, is we bring um, a uniqueness, and we don't want to lose that uniqueness. And you are truly dynamic. What a personality. Well, you're Thank sweet. You so much. It's so lovely to meet you. Okay, ladies, we'll now meet a fourth generation wrestling promoter and a member of the McMahon family of wrestling royalty. Since she was a teenager, she's worked in the family business of the World Wrestling Entertainment which broadcasts to 36 million viewers in more than 150 countries and boasts the number one sports channel on YouTube. That's amazing. Um, she has even participated as a wrestler and developed some signature movies, including The Clothesline, The Spear, and The Hair Pull Snapmare. Please welcome Stephanie, Stephanie McMahon and Sports Illustrated, Maggie Gray. Yes, now? Hello, hello. How's everybody? I invented none of those moves, <laughs> for the record. You executed them well, though. Oh, well, not <laughs> even uh, ish. <laughs> um, okay, so the last time that Stephanie was here on an MPW stage, you talked a lot about your family and your upbringing, and it is really cool that at 12 years old, your best friend was Andre the Giant. But I want to talk about your business. Yes. Because this is really important to you, and also, it's huge business. WWE is coming off the best quarter of their history. When media companies, which you are, and live event companies, which you are, and licensing companies and merchandise companies are seeing things go down, how are you having your most successful moment? I think it all gets down to uh, what we are. Um, we're a content company and we're storytellers. And I think that that is the number one reason why we have had this success is because we've always straight, stayed true, God bless you, to, to who we are and, uh, and how we tell our stories, you know, staying slightly ahead of the curve. You never want to be so far ahead of the curve in terms of technology and distribution that people can't relate. You never want to be behind the curve. You want to be slightly ahead of the curve, which was where we were in launching our OTT subscription service, the WWE Network. Yeah, let's talk about the network for a moment. I just assume, because I work in media, that everyone knows what OTT is. We'll just say it's like a, it's streaming on the internet. It doesn't mean cable. It's not direct broadcast. You guys went to it. And you had an opportunity, though, to just create a normal linear network, and you almost did it, and then something stopped you. Talk about that. Yes, yeah, so our fan base, which is you know considerable, um, has been asking for a network for a very long time. And that's also one of the reasons why I think WWE has been so successful, because we listen to our audience on every conceivable way, whether it's our over 500 live events, as you mentioned, throughout the year that act effectively as a focus group, digital and social media, where we have over 820 million followers across all social channels, whether it's through data and analytics through the WWE network, but to, to your point, we were pretty far down the pike with a linear deal, a traditional linear deal, but they wanted to lock our rights up for 10 years. 
And we decided to relook at that model. And we did some more research. And we found that our viewers were five times more likely to consume our content online than the American norm. So we realized we really had an opportunity there. And we have never been afraid to take calculated risks as a company. Uh, we, let's see, in, in the 80s, I sh we say we, my father, uh, pioneered the pay-per-view industry with WrestleMania, which was like our Super Bowl and still is like our Super Bowl. Um, and it was available on closed circuit television. And it was a near capacity crowd of 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden introducing elements of pop culture like Cyndi Lauper accompanying Wendy Richter to the ring for, the, for our women's championship match, Liberace and the Rockettes opening the show. Um, Muhammad Ali was a special guest referee in the main event. And this pop culture relevancy is still a part of our strategy today. And then you fast forward to WrestleMania at AT&T Stadium where we broke our own attendance record of over 101,000 people. And not only was WrestleMania available on pay-per-view, but also through any streaming device you own through the WWE Network. So we once again disrupted our own distribution model and we've more than doubled what was our pay-per-view revenue. So this is not unique, though, in the sports and sports and entertainment realm. You're seeing everyone now with their own channels and trying to protect their own content. But it's working for you better than baseball and, in some cases, other those individual sports. Why do you think so? Because I believe that that's because of the way we do it. And we have a, a content ecosystem, and it's basically three different tiers. So one part does not work without the other. We have our traditional linear model, where we have in the States partnerships with NBC Universal on USA Network, five hours of live content every single week, 52 weeks a year, no off season, no rerun. And then we license that content also to partners all around the world. We're actually in 180 countries and in 25 different languages. We're available in 650 million homes worldwide. Then we have partnerships with um, ESPN, for example, where we have a 30 for 30 coming out on, on one of our uh, biggest icons, Ric Flair. Um, Andre the Giant, as you mentioned, we have a partnership with HBO Sports where um, a, a biography is going to be coming out on Andre. We have Total Divas and Total Bellas on the E! Network, um, which is our reality programming. The second piece of, of that content ecosystem is digital and social, or, or AVOD. And uh, in addition to being the number one sports channel on YouTube, we are also the second most viewed channel on YouTube in the world. When I heard that stat, I was like, wait, no, what? God, I, need to, I need to back that up. Can, can we look at the research and the data here? The second most viewed YouTube channel in the world behind a Bollywood channel called T-Series, I believe, and ahead of PewDiePie. You're coming right? for them. <laughs> we are. We are. Bollywood, look out. Um, but, you know, and, and we do create original content for digital and social platforms. You know, there certainly is some repurposing list shows and that kind of thing of, of our linear content, but it is important to create content for those platforms. You can't just, you know, have one size fits all because these consumers are using these platforms in different ways and they're looking for authenticity. They're looking for um, products that are that are catered to them and created for them. So to that end, how do you not oversaturate the market? Because you have so much content. You also have not just the WWE superstars. You also have NXT, which is basically like a minor leagues. You're developing your own. Yep, and that's talent. exclusively on the network. And that's exclusive, and people go nuts for that as much as they right. do for the main roster, if you will. Um, but how do you make sure you don't oversaturate? Well, and the third piece of that content ecosystem is the WWE Network, where our pay-per-view programming really is the most, uh, the biggest draw, I should say, and, and that is unique to that platform. And I think that in terms of saturation, you just have to be strategic. You know, we produce 1,500 hours of content every year that's viewed over 6 billion views in 2016. And you just have to make sure that, that you're strategic. We have a whole team of people who help decide what content goes where. And you know, the linear is, is sort of the, the bigger exposure at the moment um, in terms of that long form content. And our network partners, because partners are incredibly important to amplify your message. Uh, they, they really are. And, and good partners can really help build your business. Um, across all different sectors. And as you mentioned, we really are a fully integrated media company, yeah. more akin to Disney um, than, than anything else with, you know, we're a billion dollar brand at retail. We have, you know, obviously I mentioned all of our different forms of distribution. We have deals with movie studios. 
Uh, we have a movie coming out, Fighting With My Family, that, that's going to be coming out soon in, okay. in partnership with MGM. So really, it is all different touch points. Yeah, everywhere your customers are, you're there for them. You talked about the brand loyalty. I mean, this is a real thing. And if anyone has ever been to one of WWE's live events, you've described it before as performance art akin to ballet. That's correct. But when you go to the Bolshoi, you don't have people in the back saying, more pirouettes, and then they do it. But wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it would. It would <laughs> this actually happens while you're doing live events. You're also taking the feedback from the fans in real time. I mean, when you go to a football game and you boo and say bad call, the coach doesn't change the play. You guys have the ability to do that. What does that, the power of your audience is very strong. How do you balance what they want and what you want? Uh, so thank you for, for teeing it up that way because, again, I think it, getting back to your first question, it's one of the keys to WWE's success is the engagement of our audience. Our audience tells us what they love, what they don't like, and worse, what they don't care about. And you have to be listening. And in WWE, yes, we do. We pivot on the fly. It's an advantage that we're live. You know, we, we do set our storylines out a year in advance, WrestleMania being our Super Bowl, and then we, you know, program backwards. But you know, things happen. The, the audience might not be invested in a character that we think they will, they will be invested in for whatever reason. There could be an injury that happens because we really are, you know, an incredible athletic event as well. Um, you know, anything can happen. So that ab ability to pivot and, and twist is really important. And when you think about NXT, for example, our developmental system, our audience is actually determining who makes it to the next level, who goes to that main roster. And they know it. They know that they are a part of that person's success, so they are that much more invested in it. And again, I just think that engagement is, uh, is really important. And can I jump on yeah, before? So, and another example of that is what happened with our women's division, which I think is particularly relevant here. Uh, we have what's called the women's evolution happening in our business right now. That, that's how we hashtag it. And what happened was we had branded our women's division. Women have always been a part of our show, um, but they weren't necessarily seen on par with the men. They were often the managers, they were the valets, they were the eye candy, if you will. And while there were a number of us fighting, you know, to, to have our women represented differently, it was determined that our, that's not what our audience wanted until one key pivotal moment. Our uh, division was called the Divas Division at that time, and when we created the Divas Division, the word diva was not negative, it was positive. It was the Divas of Soul, Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, um, and it was successful for us for a time. But there was a match that took place that lasted all of 30 seconds, which was not uncommon with our women, and our fan base, male and female, started a hashtag called Give Divas a Chance and it trended worldwide for three days. They were asking for more athleticism in the matches, better character development, better stories for our women. And it was so loud and so strong that our chairman and CEO, yes, also my father, Vince McMahon, responded and said, we hear you keep watching, give divas a chance. And since that time at the WrestleMania I mentioned before with over 101,000 people, we chose our biggest platform for one of our female Hall of Famers to come out and introduce the rebranding of the Divas Division to the Women's Division. She showcased a new championship belt that was a, a butterfly into something that was more akin to the men's championship belt, but still feminine, and said that our women were now going to be called superstars, same as the men. Yeah. And since that time, our women have been regularly main eventing pay-per-views and our television programming. And there's a lot more work to do, but it's... I mean, and also their social media followings are some of the biggest in terms of female athletes in the world. And, you know, from the business side, though, during the Attitude Era, which yes. is much, much different than sort of the storylines you're seeing now in the WWE, that sort of how women were portrayed could have been seen as a negative. You know, you yep. how, did, how did you turn it into a positive? I mean, I know that the, that the fans wanted it and that Vince went along with it and then built it and you built it, but that was seen as a point of like a not strength, a weakness, and then you I, I turned agree. it into a strength. Absolutely, bless you. And I think that, you know, it's important to, to recognize when you aren't doing something right, you know, and to be authentic with your, with your audience and with your consumers and with your business partners. And we weren't necessarily portraying women the right way. I was a part of that as a television character. 
Um, and I know how I felt at times. And, um, and I didn't like it. And I think that the women who were a part of our show were no less of, of athletes. Um, they're, when they were featured in matches, you know, they showcased their athleticism. It just wasn't the right depiction. It wasn't the right story. And I think that because of all of the women who have paved the way, way before the Attitude Era, um, you know, we, we've been around for a very long time. Um, you know, and, and every woman who's ever stepped foot in the ring, including the great Mae Young, who wrestled for eight decades. <laughs> you talk about a pioneer in the industry. She had an anchor tattoo on her forearm. I mean, this is one of the toughest women in the world. Could drink the men under the table. Um, and, and she was a huge part of this. And actually, we have, have evolved, as I mentioned, and we had our first ever women's only tournament called the Mae Young Classic. Yeah. Um, and that took place, the, the finale, um, just this September, live on the network. Um, I want to get to this, because we only have a minute left. Okay. Last, you have three daughters. 11, 9, and 7. You grew up in this business. I mean, literally, you were the child model for the clothes. You were answering phones, all of that. Do you want your girls to have that same experience? Do you want them to grow up in the business like you did? They're already growing up in the business, but I have two requirements for my girls, and that is one, that they do what makes them happy, what they're passionate about, and two, that they work hard. Because I think work ethic is incredibly important for so many reasons, if only to accomplish goals, right? The little goals that you set for yourself throughout the day when you work hard to achieve them, those build confidence, those successes. And when you have a strong work ethic, and you apply yourself and you accomplish what you set out to do, I think that there's no greater opportunity. And you said you want them to work somewhere else first. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I want them to work somewhere else for at least five years. I want them to have an advanced degree and I want them to speak another language. <laughs> to no come into the girl. company business. <laughs> if, if, they want, if they don't want to do those things to work outside the business, that's fine. But to come into WWE, those are the, those I, are the rules. I bet the only place they can't work, not at the Bollywood channel. <laughs> Direct competitor on Are you YouTube. kidding? Learn everything they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Stephanie McMahon, everybody. Thank you so <laughs> much, Stephanie. Guys. That was great. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Fabulous job. I'm going to stay over here. I'm okay. staying over here. Thank you. Yes? I'm enjoying the video. Oh, wow. I didn't know I was doing that. I thought. Billie Jean once said, we should never, ever underestimate the human spirit. We honor what she calls all of the off-the-court stuff to change how women athletes and women everywhere view themselves and to give everyone, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, including my two daughters, a 
chance to compete both on the court and in life. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that Billie Jean King is the single most important person in the history of women's sports. She's been the biggest influence in my life outside my family. She wanted more for not only women in sports, to give them an opportunity to come and play on equal terms, but also the way we guys look at women now in the boardroom. Nobody gave it more than Billie Jean King. Among the many things I find so impressive about Billie is her steady and frankly lifelong dedication to challenging and changing things that most people would just accept. Her honesty, courage for doing the right thing, but definitely not the easy thing. Billie Jean always says this, champions adapt and pressure is a privilege. I really wanted to start getting the, the hearts and minds of people to get in alignment with this idea of equal opportunities and rights for men and women. Along with her being so revolutionary, she's so important to me because I wouldn't be able to play on the WTA tour without her. What makes her such a role model to all of us is that she has never veered from her core values. In 74, Larry and I were involved in forming World Team Tennis. We have men and women on the same team, and that's what I want the world to look like. Wow. Yeah! Thank you! Wow. Oh, wow. Great. So we have to thank Billy very much for, for being with us because she's been a little busy lately. She just she and Alana Kloss, her partner in business and in life, just came in from London. So you were with us last night and, and yesterday. So thanks for being here. That's wonderful. I love we love coming. Every every year we can make it, we really make an effort because yeah, and first of all, it's great to reconnect with a lot of you and also meet new people. Um, just Network and connect. Um, it was so funny, Maggie. Backstage, we were. Uh, Billy was giving color commentary on the <laughs> on the clip from her movie. And, Somebody was you know, asking me. And and the scene with Jack Kramer talking about men being faster and stronger. And Actually, you they still, are. You still get a visceral reaction when you hear Jack Jack Kramer speak. Don't Actually, you? we made amends in 1984 at the. Uh, Let's see, Chancellor Young, UCLA Chancellor, the Olympics were in, in, were in Los Angeles in 84. So we sat next to each other, and he changed because he had a granddaughter. Oh. That changed everything. Because wow. I wanted to make amends with him anyway. I'm very big on that, and then keep moving forward. And so I sat next to him. They said, would you sit next to Jack? I go, I'd like to. And everyone went, <gasps> the whole table was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> Yeah, that's actually something that I notice a lot with you and just watching now Battle of the Sexes sort of reaffirmed it, which is you have this, is it empathy for people who have treated you badly? I mean, even Bobby Riggs, who was so chauvinist and maybe it was an act, but maybe he did feel that way, who's to know? But you always seem to handle him with kind of a- Oh, I enjoyed him because he was one of my heroes. He was number one in the world in 1939. He won the singles, doubles, and mix at Wimbledon. And then the World War II came along and he never got the attention that he craved. Uh, he was number one in the world in the 40s, and people didn't know that. So here was his chance to finally, yeah, everybody knows who I am. And he was always a gambler, hustled, so he always wanted to make deals. He's always wanted to be in the action. So I understood him, and I love entertainment anyway. I love entertainment. What is your, I mean, Billy, I think you could, you have and you can teach us a lot about working against our, uh, making progress against our uh, kind of, uh, enemies is the wrong word, but you know, we opened this morning with a panel on gun control and how I saw to, that. how to um, reach across the aisle and um, just for sides to come together who don't understand each other. So in fighting for equal pay, for women in sports, 
what are the couple of guidelines that you can pass on that might be able to help us make progress in the coming decades in the area of equal pay and other areas? Well, first of all, you don't take anything personally. That's number one. If you do that, you're finished. You're done. So you might as well give it up. So don't take anything personally. They're talking about how they feel and what they think. It's not about you. It's them. So I'm very big on that. And then also, um, how can I expect someone to respect me if I don't respect them? Like a lot of, like uh, there's a couple of male players, nobody respects me. Well, I'll tell you why they don't respect you. You don't respect anybody. You have to respect others. No matter, you know, it's the human race. We have to respect each other. The only, th it's really difficult though. I mean, my dad was a firefighter and he used to talk about guns. Never ever have a gun near you in the home. I don't care if it's locked, children find a way to get into it. My dad every day would come home with stories like that, that someone had just been killed in the home or, or domestic abuse. He said, they're just no good. And boy was he right. And how can this country have half, over half of the guns in this country? We're only 4.4% of the population. It's scary. Anyway, I don't know, but I think uh, sports can bring people together, but also can create dialogue, dialogue like the, um, with the NFL. It's creating dialogue. It's good to have dialogue. It's good to talk things out. Get it on top of the table, not under the table. So it's, Maggie, I... We don't have to agree, but we have to get on top. You know, we started with Indra Nui yesterday, and I asked Indra about, I mean, Pepsi is a big... Uh, supporter of the NFL and, mm -hmm. and teams in the NFL. And Maggie, you... Yeah, I was just really surprised to kind of crystallize it because this is something that I cover every day. And um, what she said was five to seven years ago, there was a moral code, but now you can't be afraid to offend any of your customers. And I thought, oh, this actually crystallizes it so much. I think that if we look at the NFL and we look at what's happening with the player protests, um, it's, I think if we don't follow the money, we're, we're going to be missing out on, on sort of how we can, and what the real bottom line is of this. And I'm just curious from your point of view, Billy, is this a negotiation? I mean, it's so draped in patriotism and there's a lot of emotion involved, but at, at the end of the day, is this a negotiation? And if so, how can the players make, use that to their advantage? How can they get what they want? They are using it because we're having dialogue around it and this is their one and only platform, a lot of them. This is it. When I was 12 years old and had my epiphany that I wanted to help fight for equality the rest of my life, I knew I had a chance because tennis is a global sport and I would have a platform. And that's what's happening with the NFL. They, this is where they have their platform. Otherwise, nobody's going to listen to them. And also, it's been peaceful. It's been peaceful. That's what this country is about. We don't have to agree with them. I wouldn't do it the way uh, Kaepernick did it. But that doesn't matter. I have to respect. He was peaceful. And he, they're right. Let's face it. Men of color, especially when they're young, are just treated so badly. I mean, they're in too much, incarcerated too often. Um, I, I agree with them on a lot of things. So I would have kneeled, gotten up, and I don't know, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean. So when you hear about team owners, you know, saying they're going to bench players who kneel, what do you think? I don't know what their contract is, but I, I think if I were an owner, I'd say, you do what you need to do, but I'd appreciate it if you'd stand for the anthem, you know, because I think, that just takes care of the people who are against them. Um, because it's not, the flag doesn't, it's, they, okay, some people have made it about the veterans, the military, and that's not what they're saying. Uh, many of these NFL players have family in the military. Yeah. So this, they're not saying that. So just calm down everybody, but you can have dialogue about it. Let's face it, people of color still aren't getting a fair shake. They're just not. You look at the salaries that women make, women of color always make the least, it's not right. And we have to bring in our women of color sisters. We have to do that. We have to support them. Um, I, Althea Gibson changed my life when I was 13. I got to see her. She was the first person of color ever to win a major in our sport. She's our Jackie Robinson of tennis. Nobody hears about her because she's a woman. If she'd been a guy, it would have made a much bigger in, uh, deal. And it gets me crazy, so I'm trying to get something done for her at the U.S. Open. I want something, statu I want something to remember her by, but she changed my life. I saw her when I was 13, and if you can see it, you can be it. I didn't know what it looked like to be number one. I wanted to be number one in the world. What does that look like? What, how good is that? 
I saw her and I go, wow, I'm gonna have to really work hard if I wanna be number one. And every generation does get better. So I'm like, at least that's what my dad and mom taught me, and they're right. So I go, okay, I have to even be better in this? Oh my, God, that's unbelievable. So here's a little white girl being totally influenced by a woman of color. Because people, every single person is an influencer. You never know, and I've said this before, you never know how someone's gonna touch your life or how you're gonna touch their life. And that's why it's important to be alert as we go through life. It just is important, pay attention, right? Let's open it up to the audience. Who has a question? Uh, Jewel is up front. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I'd love to talk to you more about your message of tolerance, something I find um, frustrating. Uh, I have a fan base that's probably pretty equally split, conservative and liberal, um, which I love and I enjoy that because I talk about tolerance and we have to be able to accept other viewpoints. And so I constantly am talking to my fan base, my liberal fans, about mm -hmm. if you want to be accepted, why do you think it's a one-way street? Why aren't you accepting the other side I and totally why aren't you getting to know them? So why do we have such a hard time with this issue of respect and what actual tolerance is? Can you define tolerance for people in the room of what it means to respect somebody's viewpoint, even if they're not tolerating your own and how you find that kind of kindness, where that comes from and the idea of not taking it personally? I think you said it, Jewel. It's where it's coming from, your heart and understanding that not everyone's going to agree. The most important thing is we can sit down and listen to each other, even if we diametrically are opposed, somehow you have to uh, understand this is a person who's had different experiences than we have, or if you're liberal, or and try to understand their side of it. Um, I know people on both sides, and they're, they're really far right and far left. Uh, I'm more down the middle, but you know, it's a big shot in tennis. You gotta hit it up the middle. Today. <laughs> That's really the most important thing. When you, if you notice the pro matches, they, it's really important to get that first shot, the return up the middle. <laughs> Cuts the angle on. That, I think about that, because I use sports. I use sports analogies and things every single day in my business and in life, and it really works. Um, and I think we have to be tolerant, but I think we have to really listen to them and go away and think about what they said. Even if you don't agree with it, think about it. it you might at least try to see their side of it. Um, Who else has a question? Yes, but I think back it's here. acceptance, really. I think it's love, love of, of others. Hi, Allison Schneirav. What do the women on the tour think of the Laver Cup? And do you see sort of a Solheim Cup coming for women on tennis, or will no? We already have a Solheim. It? We have the Fed Cup, but that's Federation the Davis Cup, Cup equivalent. So I'm saying no, now no. that we've done Laver Cup. Well, Team Tennis is what. Here's my dream for Team Tennis, which is equal men and women on a team on a level playing field, which you saw a little quick there. Uh, we had our 42nd season this last time. We just sold the majority of it uh, to Mark Ein, who lives in D.C. and owns the Washington Castles. I've always wanted a World Cup since the 60s, and I want it co-ed, though I want men and women equally on a team. I want children to see men and women equal by our teams. And it, we've always been ahead. We're always a little ahead. But people are starting to catch up, and Federer did the Labor Cup in, to honor Rod Laver because that was one of that was his hero in tennis. Um, but I wish he had done the women too. If you really want to know, we need togetherness. We need to be. We're all in this. Just like we need men to help us get equal pay for equal work. Because a lot more CEOs are men than women. If they would just automatically say we're going to do it, like Mark Benioff of Salesforce, he just did it. Yeah. You can do it. They can do it. They need to step up. The men and the, all women CEOs, men and women CEOs, need to step up and just make it happen. They have to do it. They have to lead. It's called leading. Billy, what is the Billie Jean King Leadership <laughs> in Institute? We have a, no, we have a minute. Initiative. <laughs> initiative. We, they, we need to do it. Uh, the Billie Jean King Leadership Initiative is exactly about getting equal pay and equal work in the workplace. It's about authenticity. It's about purpose. It's about flexibility because the millennials, we know, we, Deloitte did a survey over a couple of years, three years, and we know that's what they want. They want inclusion. The millennials, we know they're gonna be 75% of the working force in 2025. That's what we're gonna deal with. And then the Gen Z. And I want those two generations when they watch the battle of the sexes to get fire in their belly to fight for freedom and equality forever. And that means in the workplace, in family, in every phase of life. That's why I hope the movie touches our hearts and minds 
to take up the mantle and really fight for freedom and equality because that's what we need at the world. And every generation has to start over and do this. The movie is fantastic. It is fantastic. Thank you for all you do and all you will do in the next couple of decades. We're not ready, kids. Billy We're not finished, right, kids? I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks so much, everyone. It's been great seeing you. Thank you. Okay, I just need help Give getting down. Hey. It's great to see you. It's great to see you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Go. Love her. We love her. Okay, our next guests are disruptors. They've disrupted the. They've disrupted retail. Uh, we have uh, one of retail's top venture capitalists, founder and partner in a venture capital world with only seven percent female leadership. Um, our other guest is a designer whose brand is at the intersection where tech and fashion merge and who focuses relentlessly on millennials um, and constantly innovates. If you've noticed the gray bag I've been carrying around the last couple of days, it is a Rebecca Minkoff bag. It's my favorite bag. Please welcome Rebecca Minkoff and Kirsten Green with Fortune's Michal Levram. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I was very intimidated uh, picking what to wear today in the presence of you <laughs> ladies. Um, so just by, by way of, of quick introduction, not that they really need it, but um, Rebecca Minkoff is co-founder and creative director of Rebecca Minkoff, and Kirsten Green is general partner at Forerunner. Is it Forerunner Ventures? Yeah. Forerunner Ventures. So um, last year, we had Angela Aaron's Apple's um, retail chief on our stage, and she said that their newly redesigned stores are not just retail stores, they are the company's next big product. She thinks of them as town squares instead of just a retail space. So does that resonate with both of you and, and what does it mean and is that direct, the direction that we're going towards? I think now more than ever it resonates with us. You know, you have a million choices today. A lot of it is online. And so the girl, our customer at least we know, wants an experience in store that's not just shopping. It's about touching and feeling but connecting to a culture or a tribe or a movement. And so we try and have that read, really breathe that in our store with events, mentorship, fireside chats. You know, we're an event-driven company within our stores to, to talk to that exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree, totally. I think it's like one of the underpinnings of the whole reorganization of the retail ecosystem. And it's really, it's, it's driven by a couple of different things, but I think a big driver of it is customers um, access to information and how that's reshaping how they're making purchase decisions and what sorts of things they're gravitating towards and resonating with and part of that is you know connecting with brands that that um, they identify with that they feel like are authentic that stand for something and part of um, delivering on that experience is having a multi-layered experience and so now this option about thinking what this what is the store what purpose is it serving because you can buy things online and so a store is you know kind of I think opened up an opportunity to be a new experience so so on, on, on the heels of that Rebecca explain walk us through what the experience is like walking into your store so we figured out that our how many, how many of you have been, by the way, show of hands? <laughs> We've got a, a few people here. <laughs> so uh, with millennials specifically, we figured that there are definitely two types of people, but there is a span in between. You want to be anonymous and have no one talk to you, and you want to be a celebrity and get that treatment. So we want you to tell us how you want to be treated when you walk into the store. And we do that easy with a touch screen. You can browse through looks. You can order a drink. Champagne is our most number one requested drink. Um, goes well with shopping. <laughs> goes yeah. well with shopping. Um, and you can actually start building your fitting room and have an associate gather everything for you. And once you get into the fitting room, rather than always relying on the associate who might be pushing you because they want to make an extra commission, um, I tell you what I think you should wear with that dress and that outfit. So our touchscreen mirror actually uh, feeds in looks that we've created. And you can order a size. There's no more getting dressed and peeking your head out and hoping an associate sees you. 
Um, you can actually order additional items, order more champagne, um, check out seamlessly, and really have this experience where you talk to no one or you can be waited on hand and foot. And so, we, you know, we also did lighting. If you're getting dressed by occasion, you kind of want to see how you look. And I'm sure many of you have experienced lighting in a fitting room that makes you run. And so we've changed the lighting so you have four different options to really be able to uh, tune your outfit to where you're going. And, and just a note, some of those options for lighting include afternoon on the High Line, Brooklyn morning, and average de default, which is otherwise, no otherwise known as cruel light of day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what can um, big retailers take from that? I mean, is this something that can be replicated on a larger scale when we're talking about department stores? It can be. I mean, Ralph Lauren uh, is an example of someone that replicated the technology. Also, as a retailer, for the first time, you see dressing room abandonment. You actually, we actually know what went in, what didn't get purchased, what might have a fit issue. So for us, it allows me to be a smarter designer and us to really keep tailoring to our consumer and what she wants and, and not wonder what happened once she got into the dressing room. So, so Kirsten, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, what has guided your investment strategy? You've, you've invested in Jet.com and Warby Parker, um, Dollar Shave Club. Some of these have had huge exits, some of the biggest exits in, in e-commerce. So um, should we even be calling it e-commerce, first of all, at this point? We don't use that word. What do you We, we use? call it commerce. Commerce. Yeah, yes, and, commerce. and we kind of work within the framework that the customer wants what the customer wants, when they want it, where they want it. And if you want to build a big business that customers fall in love with, mm -hmm. you need to think about how you're going to meet that goal. Um, and, um, and really, it's very much a, a 360 experience. So, so what, what's the common denominator in some of the companies in the startups yeah. that you've invested? I mean, you know, for sure, it's a focus on the consumer. Mm -hmm. So kind of a general, like, working premise that we have is that, you know, product is king. It's always been really important to have a great product, to have a strong value proposition. But today, there are so many products out there. And I think, you know, probably everybody feels a little bit inundated by different, by different products. And, and so it's getting increasingly hard to compete just on that. Um, price is, is, is a pretty hard business model to compete on. Um, and the idea of access is, you know, it, there's, there's not much around exclusivity. And so that kind of leaves experience as the way to really differentiate yourself and to stand out in the crowd. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we always kind of bring a very customer-centric view to how we're looking at business opportunities and trying to get in the head of the founder that we're meeting with. Like, how are they approaching the space? How are they thinking about the customer? How are they thinking thinking about kind of really serving the customer, mm -hmm. because the product is one part of that, but it is much more holistic. And so in each case, I think that you know, there's a real consumer focus. How do you guys think about mixing online and, and offline in your case? So for us, we view it again as one channel. You know, our associates at the store are actually incentivized to stay in touch with their client. And as long as they're in touch with their client, well, within a six month period, if that client buys online, they still get the commission. So it's kind of looking at the whole, and then you, know, you can also order things um, online to be ready in the store when you arrive, or vice versa. You can pick out everything in the store and have it shipped to you. So we really just try and make it a seamless experience so that you can go in the store and have whatever experience you want. You're not pushed to buy. Um, and, that, and that's how my, you know, our consumer shops today. She doesn't want to have to be tethered to, oh, I can only do this in the store, or I can't return. She wants it all, so we're trying to give her that to her. And for you to be able to track her across all those places and uh -huh. so know who she is and how she's shopping. So if I walk into your store and I've been before, you know who I am? Well, you opt in. So we do want to respect your privacy. So if you decide to opt in, then yes, we know you've been there before. We can pull up your previous shopping history and, and get yeah, to know you. Glasses of champagne. Yep. Once you're in the dressing room, <laughs> here's all the other things you have. Uh -huh. Rebecca, you know. Yeah. OK. What about, um, let, let's talk about Amazon. You mentioned you can't compete on price. And of course, I was just thinking <laughs> Amazon. But um, <laughs> what, I mean, they've over the last decade or so, um, the companies bought uh, Zappos and diapers.com and of course Whole Foods and a lot of, I mean, these are just some of the larger acquisitions, but so many different businesses that they've um, entered. And what, what do you think they're gonna buy next? I mean, what, what, what will they do, what won't they do? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, 
I don't, I, I'm not gonna predict that. Um, but I do think that the, the recent move to buying Whole Foods was obviously really interesting and supporting this thesis about, you know, online and offline are, are merging and, um, and that's an important part of business. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, I imagine that they're also focused on how to deliver a great customer experience and the hallmark of Amazon has always been convenience and access and, um, and being able to depend on the next day shipping. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that is, that, is, that is a layer of service. It's not satisfying all layers of service. And I think a lot of times we're looking at businesses that are trying to compete and win on those other layers. And I you know, imagine anybody looking at the space is trying to kind of evaluate themselves across all of those. So does Amazon worry you in any way? I think it focuses us. We have to even be stronger as a brand. I have to make sure that my customer and my girl has an allegiance to not just the product, but what I stand for, the pillars and the foundation of what else we want to achieve with the company so that if you know she's choosing between a well-priced product that's easily accessible on Amazon or going to my company, she'll choose us instead. Do you sell anything on Amazon? Not today, no. Would you? We did, yeah. So you would, again? Um, maybe. <laughs> I can't answer I think, that today. I think, what, I think also what Rebecca's referring to when she's talking about you know people choosing a brand sort of speaks to that first point I was making about the importance of, of, of connecting with the consumer and standing for something. And today with all the access to information and the ability to go to everybody's About Us page and learn about the ethos of their company and where they come from and to see them articulate <laughs> themselves across all the social media channels, like. There, there's this element of having a relationship with a brand that didn't exist before, and that, that stands for something. Okay, questions from the audience. We have microphones coming over here. Can you introduce yourself? Tracy Jensen. I just wondered if you see a change in how people wear clothes, just like Uber changed the transportation market. There's some niche players in renting outfits, mm -hmm. but, but do you see that as a trend or can you talk to if you've thought about that and whether it's some type of monthly service or, or is, does that play into your model at all? It does actually. We have um, a service on our website where you can actually um, pay over a monthly period of time and most of the women that opt in the, into that service are fully qualified to pay for that item. Uh, at once, you know, they, they make an, an income that's around $90,000 usually. So they could pay off, you know, a $195 bag pretty easily, but they're choosing to pay by month. So that was a fascinating thing for us to see as we looked into the data behind who that is and, and know that probably for us at some point, there'll be a hybrid of rental for, that we offer. I think also just quickly along those lines, like style has really evolved. It's less prescriptive than ever. It's more individual. And the idea of, you know, all of the images that were inundated, I think, has really created some freedom and some desire to have your own style. And so I think people are having more fun with it, playing with it. And, and, and along those lines, experimenting with different ways of getting access to product. Another question? Yes, uh, for Kirsten, actually, um, we were talking about Amazon, and I was wondering what you think the uh, impact of voice is on retail and brands specifically. Um, over time, yesterday the, we had the CEO of uh, Pepsi. Over time, will people still say, Alexa, give me uh, Pepsi, or will they say Coke? And Amazon decides whether it's Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Yeah, I mean, I, I think voice is, is, is going to be a big, um, going to have a big impact on retail. Um, and possibly as we kind of look out AR or um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality as well. And that will reshape a lot of different things. Um, and, and, you know, we are thinking about that through at the brand level. Like, how do people specify in a world of voice what they're looking for? Um, and I think, you know, in some ways it, it sort of, it, it makes brand even more important. You really want to have people to be able to identify your product with your brand so they can ask for it that way. And if you think about like, you know, how many times have you gone and said like, I like a Kleenex. Well, Kleenex is a brand. It's not just the actual product, but, um, but that becomes, you know, kind of what that product is known as and known for. And as people move to just simple voice commands, being able to reference a brand is a, is a big opportunity. Um, it's also a big risk if you can't. If you don't have a brand that stands for something, um, it could make it harder to operate in that environment. 
And I'm going to hope as women, I've never heard a woman go, order me a white shirt, Alexa, right? <laughs> How do any of you do that? You're going to be like, I want the Rebecca Minkoff white shirt, right? So I, I think as women, we probably also have different shopping habits that um, Amazon would have to adapt to because I could see a man saying khaki pants, you know, size 33. But for us, I think we're a little pickier than that. So um, real quick, both of you, take us five to 10 years out. How are we shopping? What are we shopping for? I mean, I think we're definitely in the age of it's good to be the consumer. You know, the consumer is kind of calling the shots and pushing people along. And I think, you know, there's, the, there's this idea that, like, you really do have a known, and, uh, a known identity when you're going shopping, and there's, like, a point of reference to what's being shown to you, um, how things are being kind of offered and marketed to you. And we've been talking about personalization for a long time, but it's not really happening, you know, mm -hmm. on a terribly... Um, impactful level yet, I feel like that will take more center stage. And again, like now we think about omni-channel being online and offline, like what else is there? Are we living in a world of, of voice or of augmented reality that brings that in closer too? And Rebecca, real quick. I would agree that I think that you're gonna see, you know, you can walk into a store for an experience only, you can, you know, virtually try on an outfit, you can see what it looks like by occasion. And again, personalized to you, I think you know, retailers will have enough data about you that you're not getting sent the thing that you don't want to see. All right. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Kirsten. Thank you. A little over a year ago, our next guest filed her landmark sexual harassment lawsuit against Roger Ailes, CEO of Fox News, which settled for $20 million. She has since reinvented herself as a women's rights activist and has a book coming out next month titled Be Fierce, Stop Harassment and Take Your Power Back. Please welcome Gretchen Carlson with Vanity Fair's Sarah Ellison. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, yes, before Harvey, the Harvey Weinstein scandal, before the Uber memo, um, there was Gretchen Carlson. Um, and I think it's a good moment to take note of where things have, how things have changed in a year and a half since you sued. Um, because immediately after Gretchen came forward, there was a, um, there was sort of an orchestrated campaign against to, to discredit you and to discredit, and a lot of your colleagues came out and spoke out very, very forcefully and uh, not very supportively, to say the least, against you. Um, I want to take a minute because we're in a room full of women, powerful women, um, supportive women, and this might fall completely flat, but um, if we can't do it here, where can we? How many people in this room have been sexually harassed? Would you raise your hand? Nice, not nice, terrible. Um, I feel like if we can't, you know, if you can't sort of raise your hand here, how, what is the distance between being able to do that here and being able to take that step um, at your workplace or, or with, with your peers? Um, Gretchen, you were immediately sort of, um, you faced this concentrated backlash when you came forward. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, so basically the way we solve sexual harassment in society right now is either to settle with women, which gags them from speaking about the details, or we force them into mandatory arbitration instead of an open court system where it's completely secret, which also gags them. So unfortunately, I can't give details about how I felt about my former colleagues, but I can tell you this. You find out who your friends are in a big way. And you know, I heard from people I hadn't heard from in 30 years, and I didn't hear from some of my own neighbors. So it can be a very alone experience. But I think from a young age, I built a tough skin, and so I was used to it. And all you have to do is look at my Twitter and Facebook feeds to see that there's a lot of people out there who still have a lot of nasty things to say about me. So what that tells me is, I still have a lot of work to do. You, um you know, I was, re I was sort of covering this at the time, and so I heard all, all of these um, comments, both supportive and not. 
one of the things that infuriated me more than anything was, well, she's, her husband makes a lot of money, so she doesn't need to worry about oh, it. And please. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> what do we need to explain to everyone in this scenario? <laughs> like, I don't have any identity. Right, exactly. Like, you're only motivated by that. But the, um, I guess, let me, let me ask you, why did you come out when you did? Can you, can you talk about that? Um, because some people said, again, your former colleagues, she only came forward when her contract wasn't being renewed. And I guess that's a, I ask you that not to be nasty, but to ask, what were you facing? Um, and why did you only come out when you learned that news? Well, first of all, there are a tremendous amount of myths that still surround the issue of sexual harassment. First of all, if you do come forward, you'll be labeled a troublemaker or a bitch. More importantly, you won't be believed. And some people have even suggested that you do it for money or fame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you know that that's the culture that we still live in, and by the way, you've worked 26 years in your career and risen to the top of it, it's the most important decision of your life to dig deep for that courage to know that you might torpedo everything that you've worked so hard for. I will say in my personal experience, when I knew that my 11 years of blood, sweat, and tears at a particular organization, when I knew that that time was coming to an end and not because I wanted it to, I knew that if I didn't do it, who was going to do it? And I had to come forward, not just for myself, but for all the other women who have remained voiceless for decades and never had their stories told, and more paramount than anything, so that my children and your children will not face the same indignities that I have had to face and millions of other women have had to face. So I did it for our future generations. Thank you. Yeah. I have to say that that's, um, there's still, there's still, um, there's the courage that it takes to come forward, but there's the courage that it takes forward to, to come forward first. And I think that that is really where you, you obviously did it. Um, the, um, and by the way, courage is not something that you just switch on a light and, and say, wow, I have that. You know, I think that's another myth here. Yeah. Courage is a, it's a building process. And, you know, luckily I had great building blocks and foundation from the way in which I was raised by incredibly supportive parents who told me I could be anything I wanted to be, but still, Courage is not an overnight experience. Mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes time, and I know that you've probably all been in those situations where you really weigh the options. Um, and yes, to be the first to do it, I have to tell you, Sarah, that watching the Harvey Weinstein revelations over the last few days, and Silicon Valley before that, and Uber, my gosh, if I had anything to do with those women feeling empowered to have a voice, my life has had so much purpose. And it's something that I never, ever expected that I would be the face of. But look what's happening. Right. The time is now. Let's talk about what is happening. Um, you mentioned these non-disclosure agreements, forced arbitration clauses. Um, those are things that you're working towards. You're, you're going down to the hill and advocating for that. You're starting your own not-for-profit organization to empower women and make them feel like they can um, come forward or support them when they're coming forward. But in the meantime, what is the piece of advice that you can offer a woman who is being sexually harassed? Mm -hmm. What can she do today? Mm -hmm. So in chapter four <laughs> of Be Fierce, I have a 12-point plan called a playbook. This comes out next Tuesday. I encourage any woman who's currently going through this to check out especially this chapter. I mean, I'll just highlight for you the, the main points. I think women, especially strong women who've been successful, think that we can overcome this and that suddenly the person who's harassing us will just finally see us for our brains and our talent, right? And so we actually work harder and actually don't come forward as soon as we should. But the first thing you need to do is document your experience. Document it and keep that information at home. 
Number two, find out what the tape recording laws are in your state. One party consent. There are 11 states where it's a crime. In California, ironically, where Hollywood is, it's a felony. Hmm. So find out what the laws are in your state. Seek out help from an attorney. It's crucial that you have somebody at least give you basic advice so that you know how to start the process. Number four, tell trusted colleagues you need witnesses because we still live in a he said, she said culture, unfortunately. And so you need people, especially men, to come to your defense and say, I saw that happen to her. And enablers are a whole other part of the equation. Yeah. But we, we have to empower men to help us as well. And I have a whole chapter in the book on men, because I found so many great guys out there who are already doing so much great work. The majority of men do want to help us, and we need them. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that you described how much, there, that, this was not, your experience at Fox was not the first time that you had encountered sexual harassment, no. and you had sort of just powered through, as everyone can, you know, you just work harder, you do more. Um, the, when I finished covering some of the Ailes stuff, somebody asked me, what, what, what is important about this? What is the lesson for other women in the workplace? And I was like, carry your iPhone charged with your voice memos up so that you can just press the button and like have, I mean, it's just, it was the most depressing thing. I was like, you need to get evidence. You need to be constantly collecting evidence, which nobody wants to live in a, in a, t in a place where we're always recording each other, but you do need this kind of, um, this, this sort of evidence against, against potential um, harassers. What, were you surprised by the Harvey Weinstein story? No. <laughs> what I have been buoyed by is how many women put their names and their faces to that story. They weren't all anonymous. They were real people and many of them were famous. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna change this. This issue is not going away now. And that's why I'm doing so much work on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Listen, this is what I always say. Sexual harassment is not, it's, it's not like a political party. It's apolitical. When somebody decides to pounce on you or harass you, they don't ask you what party you belong to. They just I'm, don't. They I'm just do it. I'm going to open up for, a, we don't have a lot of time for questions. We're only, but I know that this is, a, I feel like some of the best questions will come from the audience. So I'm going to do that in a second. But um, I want to ask you, what have people, who has talked to you on Capitol Hill? Can you name any names? Can you talk about like what the response has been? Yeah, so I've been very public. Is this with the one area where Congress is going to actually do something yes, useful? Yes, and you know what? I am bound and determined I'm going to get a bipartisan bill on this. So I have been... And what would it be? I mean, it, it would be to take the secrecy out of forced arbitration clauses. Right. So that at least the pendulum would be more equal between employer and employee. And this is what I said in the New York Times op-ed yesterday. Predators, you're on notice. This is a warning shot that we're firing that women are going to continue to speak up and expose what's going on in corporate America. You talk so much about how women, when they do speak up, even in this moment when we're all so woke about this issue, they do still get blackballed mm -hmm. in their industry. Do you feel like you've paid a price in your industry for coming forward? No. I mean, I've had five full-time jobs since I lost my job in writing the book, in advocating on Capitol Hill, in starting my fund, Gift of Courage, in starting the Gretchen Carlson Leadership Initiative, which will serve underprivileged women in a nine-city tour across the country for free. That was the gnawing question that I kept getting asked, Sarah, is what can you do for the single mom working two jobs trying to make ends meet who's being sexually harassed? It, it killed me every night when I went to bed that I didn't know what to answer to that. And now I do, through my leadership initiative. Mm -hmm. They can come to these three-day workshops in nine cities for free yeah. and get a head start. So, no, and I have more respect for television executives that eventually when I'm done with these four full-time jobs or they're not as, as busy for me, that I plan to go back to my career. I've always worked my whole life. And I could have just gone home and, and spent you know, a lot more time with my two beautiful children. Right but I really do want to get back into my chosen profession. Um, is there a question in the audience? I see one right over here with a bright pink arm in the air. 
And I think we might only have time for Thank one you. question. Hi, this time. Alexandra Leventhal. I have a 21-year-old daughter. She's a senior in college. I'm so overwhelmed and impressed with she and her friends who are strong, smart, sorry, getting emotional, um, girls, many of whom are going into investment banking and consulting. What, what advice should I tell them? Because they're naive, but they're smart, they're optimistic. They will unfortunately encounter this. So what advice can I give them? The advice that I give to young people is that we have to all agree, men and women, that we're going to speak up when we see this. Because one person can make a difference, but collectively we rule the world. And I think especially with millennials, they want to see how their work actually does something. They want to see the end result. And I think on this particular issue, they really can get men on their side as well. I've always said I work more for my son than I do for my daughter because I want him to respect his future female colleagues in the way in which he respects his mommy at home right now. That is crucial. And I've seen bravery pass on to my kids. My daughter came home from school and took on people who were bugging her right after my story broke. And she said, Mommy, I was able to stand up to them finally because I saw you do it. That is the gift of courage. And we're passing that on one woman at a time right now. We're seeing what's happening. I am so optimistic with these horrible revelations coming out because it's optimistic for us as women and especially for young men and women. I can't, we, we're out of time. I'm so sorry, I'm Gretchen. So sorry. Thank you so much for everything. You're amazing. It has been a wild ride for our next guests over the past 10 months of they, as they've endeavored to interpret the policies of the new administration, I think we're all doing that, and overcome the fake news moniker that the media has been burdened with. To fight the fake news reputation that the president bestowed on some members of the media, news organizations such as the WNYC, the New York Times, and Vanity Fair have used ad campaigns to champion the honesty and responsibility of their journalism. Joining Times editorial director Nancy Gibbs, please welcome Dana Bash, Mary Catherine Hamm, and Andrea Mitchell. Good morning. Good morning. So busy news morning. There are so many places we could start. But um, I guess because I know we're all having a fairly intense week. Uh, <laughs> that let's do the comparative study. Uh, Andrea, you are in the middle of a very intense story right now that NBC News is breaking around critical national security questions. So let's start right there. Uh, Tell us how you are, well, are you getting any sleep and how you are, <laughs> how you are working this story? Have you met well, Andrea? She doesn't sleep. Yeah, I know. <laughs> stakes couldn't be higher. The stakes are really high. Within the last few minutes, the president has tweeted twice about us, including one, uh, well, calling us fake news, comparing us to CNN, uh, now saying worse than CNN, and in the last tweet, suggesting maybe it's time to challenge NBC's license, given that cables are not regulated, but uh, broadcasts are. So um, there, the fight is on, engaged. I was part of the reporting team last week that reported uh, the fight with Tillerson, the moron comment that followed up by just how the White House was affected by this and the State Department, the, the, the anger of the president against Tillerson, the anger of the vice president and the question now of whether Tillerson will stay or will go. We've seen a lot of reporting about who might replace him and why he might stay because of the upcoming China trip. But now today, a team led by Kristen Welker, Courtney Kuby, our Pentagon reporter, and also um, Carol Lee, um, our great national political reporter, reporting that the, one of the contributors to the moron comment was that in the meeting in the tank, 
the secure room of the Pentagon that had just preceded it, the president had argued very forcefully with his team that he wanted to increase the nuclear arsenal tenfold. Uh, not modernize it as President Obama and other presidents have. There's a multi-trillion dollar modernization program underway under President Obama that continues, but actually increase the numbers of weapons which have been reduced since Ronald Reagan. So Reagan, Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, all have had nuclear treaties with the former Soviet Union and then with Russia, continuing the down, uh, the, the reduction of our nuclear arsenal down to 4,000 from a high of 32,000 during the 60s at the height of the Cold War. And these are international treaties. Plus, with modern weapons, we don't need as many nuclear weapons. We have all kinds of other platforms in the triad. So uh, this follows up on a, a trend by the president to want the biggest, the best. And this followed a, by a day his argument uh, to fire General Till uh, Nicholson, the leader of the Afghan troops, without ever having met him. It was in the context, this was July 20th. Um, it was within days that you had the, you know, the Reince Priebus uh, departure, the Sean Spicer firing. Uh, we were at the time in Aspen, I was interviewing General Dunford, who had just come from that meeting. Um, on the next week, the president spoke to the Boy Scouts. Tillerson was back home in Texas for his son's wedding. That's when we reported last week he was thinking about not coming back and was talked by Kelly and, and Mattis into staying. Kelly was not yet chief so this of staff, fuse so there's a lot of turmoil. This fuse has been burning for a long time. Exactly, that and, broke and we're not suggesting that it was the, um, the, it was this argument in the tank that led to the moron comment. We don't know that, but this certainly but was, that was a the big contributor to igniting. And just to say, this was a critical time, this 10-day period, if you look at the calendar, mm -hmm. in the life of this White House. I mean, each, each of you in different ways from different perspectives have had these moments where you feel like you are wrestling with how to tell a story and how to think about a story that I think is unlike any probably any of us have faced in our mm -hmm. lifetimes. Dana CNN too has come under tremendous fire for its reporting and how it has approached these stories. How have you, how have you handled that? Look, it's not easy and it's not, it, it's, it's genuinely not a partisan thing. It is. President Trump and his administration, the way that they operate is unlike any other Republican or Democrat. Now, that's why he would say he was elected, because they don't want to be like everybody else. They want to be different. That's fine if you really are going to drain the swamp and disrupt the institutions and deal with lobbying and all that stuff. As a reporter, one of the things, one of the many things that is so frustrating and really, really tricky is when you have a story, and I'm sure you guys have dealt with this, that you, you have really solid sourcing on. You know you got it. And you go to the White House for confirmation or for a statement, and they say, it is just not true. If you go with this, you are going to be wrong. And it's not wrong, where in some cases, two days later, it actually happens, so you know that you weren't wrong. You know that you were right. And so how do you deal with the, the idea of going to, uh, of, of an institution, the White House, the people who work in the White House, who, it just my experience, I covered the Bush White House. If we had a story that they didn't want us to go with, but it was right, and we would go to them and say, we've got this, they would, gen unless it was a national security issue, uh, which is a whole different question, they would generally say, I'm not confirming that for, for you, but I'm not going to call you and tell you that you're wrong. That's kind of the wink and the nod, right, in reporting. And that doesn't happen in this White House. So you're really in this, you're kind of in this pretzel. Well, this is why we keep seeing, you know, it used to be you had a two-source rule or a three-source rule for a sensitive story. Right. And now we're routinely seeing the Washington Post publish a sensitive story and have right. to say, we spoke to 18 people. Right, and then, you have the, and then you have the added, not just the White House spokesperson saying it's wrong, even though it's right. Then you have... The President of the United States using this unbelievable tool, Twitter, to attack the organization. And obviously, the experience with you this yeah. morning is the, is the latest example. Well, so I want to talk about Twitter. And Mary Catherine, you've talked about when you have decided, I am going to you know, put, put it down. Yes. <laughs> Tell me how you think about, especially since you know, you've written eloquently about the outrage industry. Right. It, which is, you know, it's been a very successful business model for a lot of organizations, including in media and elsewhere. 
Um, and Twitter is as good an engine of outrage as we have ever seen in all of human history. Yeah, when you first said, you know, how do you sort of deal with the pace of news these days? And some people do not have this luxury. I'm raising two kids on my own, and I am an unplugger um, sometimes. And even when the president is breaking news on a Friday night, sometimes I just walk away. And there are times uh, where I do think, and I, I used to be very laissez-faire about new media and thought it was the greatest thing ever, and I'm a Twitter enthusiast, and I'm on there a lot. But in the wake of, say, Charlottesville, uh, I was online, and just th it was my daughter's birthday, did her birthday party, and then somebody tweeted me and said, well, now that your kid's birthday is over, it'd be nice to hear something from you about Charlottesville. And I wow. just said, I don't owe this, like, this no. platform a statement. I'm not, I'm not the president. <laughs> um, and so I just, I just walked away. I was like, no, this, this is not how this operates. And what I found was in that week that I walked away, I had these very edifying real conversations with my actual real friends, some online and some, because <laughs> uh, I came from, I come Human from a very, yes, I come from a very uh, diverse hometown, Durham, North Carolina, and I have a bunch of friends from back there who I could talk to about this. And those conversations were so much more rewarding. And it made me think about how much of my empathy I give away to strangers on Twitter and how much of that I should keep for having those conversations. So that was just a, like a moment where I thought, oh, there's a better way to do this. And I think that's part of what all of us are dealing with on a regular basis. When you said, uh, when you asked backstage about like a really intense week, I do want to put this one out there for, especially with women and, and so much of covering this administration um, and being in the, in the limelight and doing this work is about this work-life balance and trying to figure out how to do everything. And I was invited to co-moderate um, a primary debate in 2016 in February in New Hampshire. We don't have to get into the whole story, but four months earlier, I had very unexpectedly suddenly lost my husband. I was seven months pregnant. He died in a biking, cycling accident. Two months later, I had a baby. Two months after that, ABC said, do you want to co-moderate this debate? And I thought, that's crazy. I should not do that. <laughs> but then I thought, well, I got through that. I could get through this. And so... Going, I'm still actually in retrospect because you know when you look back at your mm -hmm. postpartum days and you're like, was I all there? <laughs> no, <laughs> you you weren't. <laughs> in retrospect, I look back and be like, maybe I should not have said yes to that, and I'm very glad I didn't go postal or weird on the stage. And the Trump factor, such a different factor mm -hmm. when you're gaming out how people will respond right. to you. I didn't know if it would get personal. I knew it wouldn't from Kasich, but I didn't know with Trump. Later it did on Twitter. But in that moment, things went fine. And so that, I do think back to that week, or the tragic week before that, and think, I can handle this. So this actually truly worries me, because at yeah. one point, in the, at the height of you know, the trolling that we were seeing, I, I did a poll of our newsroom at Time about whether, uh, about how, how men and women in the newsroom handled the responses to their journalism on social media. And more than half the women, said they had considered leaving journalism. Wow. Because of the level of vitriol and often violence and you know the, I am, I am going to come hurt your children. I mean, I know where you live. Unbelievably ugly kinds of responses. And the men in my newsroom were shocked and enraged by this and, and they, they by and large were not having the same experience. And you know, ordinarily I think we don't think in gendered ways about how we go about our work. We want to get the story, we want to tell the story, and yet that as a, as a news leader really worried me about how especially you know, NBC fielded a large team of young women covering the campaign who came in to a huge amount, for a huge amount of this vitriol, so did CNN. It's, how, have this, has this affected you when you see, or do you, my husband banned me from reading my notifications. That's, I mean, that's the, <clears throat> that's the deal, and I, I really try not to. If I read all the notifications, I would, nev I would be in a fetal position under the covers and never get out of bed. Ever. You, I, mean, I just don't, I, can I can't barely read it. keep up with what I absolutely have to read. Right. Now, I am in the situation where I have a daily program plus responsibilities on the broadcast side for Nightly News Today or .com. So I don't have the ability to unplug uh, unless I'm on some kind of vacation, and even then, not, not really. That's yeah, I'm kind of the deal that we much. have with all these platforms, with broadcast and cable and the online. I have the sort of disadvantage 
of not having had children, so I have other family obligations, though, and um, that I feel very strongly. So, but it's not anything comparable to what uh, what you guys have. What I don't read is the really mean-spirited stuff. And to what you referred to, um, the abuse that women experience online and in person in our business is appalling. Just read what Katie Turr has written in Unbelievable about what this woman, and, and we didn't reveal it during the campaign. It was quite obvious when you heard the, you know, a stadium in, in Alabama shouting you know, epithets at Katie and the president or the candidate from the podium, um, demeaning and disparaging her and pointing her out from the stage. And we had to hire security. And at one point, a Secret Service detail actually came and escorted her because the Trump reporters were in a pen. I was covering the Clinton team, and we were constrained in other ways. Mm -hmm. But the, the verbal abuse from the candidate and his followers in these large and often you know, open carry states mm -hmm. is terrifying. Mm -hmm. So I can handle people calling me out and telling me how awful I look on social media. Um, you know, I'm a big girl. I can, I can take that. And, and I also just want to bring up what we're now reading about Harvey Weinstein and the conspiracy of silence in the major industry. Um, if you look back at what Tina Fey wrote uh, and aired on 30 Rock five years ago, jokes about Harvey Weinstein harassing and abusing women, and how could this not have been known? It's just, so women occupy a special place, I think, mm -hmm. in this world of multimedia, in which we take a whole lot and we just have to um, endure it, and endure, but also support each other and speak out passionately about what women, and in my case, um, I had you know, five really terrific younger women colleagues starting out in some cases in their career, Katie for the first time covering politics. So I viewed it, and also women from other media on the trail with Hillary, and I <coughs> viewed it as, well, I'm gonna take the hit, I can do it, um, in terms of fighting for access in the Clinton campaign and fighting for security with the Trump people. And can I just add one thing to that, is that there, there actually is a sisterhood, a real sisterhood, at least in the, in yes. the, you know, in our business, uh, <clears throat> where we we kind of rely on each other to deal with this. Um, some of my closest friends are Kelly O'Donnell with your network, or Nancy Cortez with CBS, because we can relate to one another, even though we're technically competitors, um, on this level. And I think that says a lot about where we've come as women, because we don't have to be competitors, you know, with our sharp elbows. Um, to the nth degree, but we can also kind of, you know, really be there for one another. And Andrea has led, really helped lead the way well, on that. And, and the women on the, the Hillary plane, I mean, the three networks as well as the others, the print people, we were all standing, the three network correspondents, we would be standing out on the tarmac at White Plains Airport in hideous weather, getting ready to do our morning shows. And we'd all run into the bathroom and try to get our hair together, sharing curling irons or whatever we had, <laughs> while Nancy Cordes would be on the phone telling her six-year-old, no, it's, it's picture day. You've <laughs> got to wear something proper. <laughs> and Exactly. I mean, the juggling that went on, and this goes all the way back to Judy Woodruff and Cokie Roberts and I on the bus. You set the same Back in those years. You did. But it was really exponentially increased in this year because, because the, so many women were on the trail and, the and we just of it helped is, each other with everything. I want to invite you all because we only have uh, have very little time left but um, I can't see. Yes, back. Talking about sisterhood, can you talk about what role Kellyanne Conway has played in all this? <laughs> you guys look at me? <laughs> um, so I, I knew Kellyanne uh, here and there, acquaintances over the years, um, and actually looked up to her as this as woman who ran this polling firm and had created something that um, that was working to figure out what women responded exactly, to, um, and respected her work and was interested in that. I also so I I'm in a my own sisterhood of like right of center Trump like loudly Trump critical 
women, but who, by the way, we all have a Facebook group where we're like just constantly like, what are you <laughs> dealing with today? What are you dealing with today? Um, and that, that is really helpful. Uh, but yeah, there have, it depends on the day, and this is how I try to approach the Trump campaign. I'm very proud of her that she was a woman who led a presidential campaign to the White House. That was unprecedented. Um, but there are times when I'm like, nope. And then there are other times when I'm like, okay, I agree with Kelly and Conway. And the, here's the other part, and I think this is important for, we, we talk a lot about the president wasting his credibility, and it's important for, and I try to do this every day to remember that like, I have credibility to hold as well and to be really well behaved and to, not well behaved, but to be accurate um, and to be responsible. And one of the things I think we see is with someone like Kellyanne Conway, she can be such a lightning rod that I'll feel one way about what she said and then people react so mm -hmm. insanely to what she said or did or wore uh, that I end up back on Team Kellyanne within like an hour and a half because that's how Twitter works. <laughs> um, so I do think I, I try to gauge for that and try not to go off the deep end when someone someone says something I don't like or does something I don't like. Um, but I think that's a that's a bad cycle we're and in. She, and she gets hit a lot more than <clears throat> the men who do yep. exactly the same in terms of spinning for the president. Well, this audience will get to you know make their own judgment in a little bit. In the meantime, we're out of time. I could talk to you guys all day, but um, thank you. Can I just thank you for, you for yes, everything? Yes, thank you. A leader in, in media. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to stick with the very lighthearted theme we've got this morning. Just kidding. Um, our next guest was fired by President Trump for her refusal to defend his travel ban early on in his administration. You probably know who I'm talking about. She testified before Congress that she had warned the White House that then National Security Advisor Michael Flynn might be compromised and may have misled officials about his contacts with Russians. She has accused the president of destroying the fundamental independence of the Justice Department. To discuss the aftermath, please welcome Sally Yates with Time Inc.'s Chief Content Officer, Alan Murray. Thank you. Wow, oh. you haven't even spoken yeah. yet. Oh. <laughs> I don't think it's for me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sally, thanks so much for being here. Obviously, your presence is appreciated. Uh, and I, apologies for getting the guy interviewer. I hope you. No, well, I, I'm delighted to be here. And thank you for the warm welcome. I feel like I should be interviewing you. No, 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 no. And you don't want to go there. you what it feels like to be in this room of full of powerful women. Oh, this is the. This is the best week of my life. <laughs> this is why I took the job. I love these events. It's a, it's a, it's a great group. Um, so we want to talk about, Mahal talked about your 10 days as uh, attorney general. Has there ever been an attorney general for 10 days? Well, I was just acting attorney general. Yeah. I'm not, we packed a lot into those <laughs> 10 <did>. days. Um, <laughs> sort of in dog years, I think it was a lot longer than 10 days. But before we go into that, uh, just a, a little bit, I mean, prior to that, I, I, I know a little bit about your career. You were not a particularly political person. No, I had been with the Department of Justice for over 20 years. Um, before I was, had a political appointment from President Obama, first to serve as U.S. Attorney in Atlanta. Um, I had come from private practice, a big firm in Atlanta, and, and went to DOJ, and expected I would quickly go back to private practice, but I immediately uh, fell in love with the mission of DOJ and was committed to that, still committed to that, and, and sort of found myself 20 years later still there. So when you were asked to be acting attorney general, which is by definition a, a political position, even if you're acting, did you think about not doing it? I mean, did you have an option? Did you, how did it happen? Well, um, I was the deputy attorney general prior to that, the number two position in the Department of Justice. And it's, you know, it's the longstanding tradition that the deputy attorney general serves as the acting attorney general um, in a transition between administrations. And, you know, it's important in all of our agencies for there to be a smooth transition, but nowhere is that more important than at the Department of Justice, given that we were charged with national security and public safety. And, and so for that reason, I was happy to serve 
um, is acting. I thought it was important for yeah. continuity and for the nation. For Absolutely, you to do it. yeah. How quickly in those 10 days did you know that you were going to have to go to the White House on the Mike Flynn uh, issue? Um, pretty quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you know before you took the job that uh, that was going to be in? There were, you know, I can't go into the details of that beyond what I've already testified to and, and what's public now, but certainly it was. It was very soon into the tenure there that, that it, we knew that, that there was going to be an issue that we needed to apprise the White House of. Was there any question in terms of past policies, procedures of the Justice Department? Was there any question about the propriety of doing that, of going to the White House and warning the president that his national security advisor could be compromised because of contacts with the Russians, which is essentially what you did? No, I mean, there wasn't a playbook for this. Um, the good news is this doesn't happen very often. <laughs> um, so th that's the good news. The bad news is there's not really a script for how you handle it. But um, there wasn't any doubt, given the situation that we were in, um, given General Flynn's underlying conduct that I can't go into because even though everybody else has talked about it, it's classified, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, given his underlying conduct and then what continued to happen where he was misleading individuals within the White House, including the Vice President, Vice President. who was so, then going out and misleading the American public. And So in your uh, mind, there was no choice? In my mind, whether there was a choice or not, it was the right thing to do. The White House needed to know this information so that they could take action with respect and to And how this. was your action received? Um, well, I didn't expect that they were going to be happy to hear this information. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, but, but it wasn't my job to go have a lot of happy talk. Um, it was our responsibility at the Department of Justice with the National Security Division and, and with the various um, members of the intelligence community to do everything that we could to protect the national security of our country. And that included telling the White House that their national security advisor had engaged in problematic underlying conduct, that he had lied about it, that they in turn had misled the American people, and that we weren't the only ones who knew this, that the Russians knew it too, and consequently Would believed, that believed right, that, that the national security advisor was And so was how was it compromise. received? Um, well, you, you know, I think they were startled. You know, I dealt with Don McGahn. Yes. Um, you didn't this. On this one, you didn't deal directly with the president. No, no. Um, I, I dealt with Don McGahn, and, and I think, as I testified um, previously and before the Senate, um, you, we had more than one meeting on this, and, and I think he was taking it all in, and I don't really know sort of how he was dealing with that after that, because then I was I was out of the Justice Department. Well, but, so so you didn't get in those meetings. There wasn't any immediate blowback. Um, I, mean, I wouldn't call it blowback. I mean, there was in the second meeting. I remember, and, and I said this publicly that Mr. McGahn asked me essentially, "What's it to DOJ if one White House official is lying to another White House official?" And you um, explained. And it, yeah, so we kind of walked back through again. It wasn't just a question of, of one official lying to another. It was the underlying conduct that was problematic, that the American people had been misled, and again, the, the serious compromise position that it put it in. And, and you don't want your national security advisor to be in to a position. To be compromised by the Russians. That seems yeah, reasonable. It seems sort of basic to <laughs> and, us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so then the, next, then the next day after your last meeting with Don McGahn, you hear about the travel ban. How did you hear about the... Actually, it was the same day. The same I had had, The day before really I had, had a meeting. There's, there should be a movie made about these There's, 10 days. You know, the 10 days, and in fact, <laughs> what was kind of funny about this is that the normal tradition during this time is that everything stays status Nothing quo. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> everything stays status quo during a holdover time. And so the deal is, is that none of the Obama administration policies or positions and cases would change during the time you I was acting. You wouldn't make policy And likewise, yeah, I'm not going to haul off and do new policy pronouncements. We keep everything status quo. And in fact, my chief of staff had told me that things were going to be so quiet There'd be time for a lot of long, boozy lunches during this time. Um, you didn't have, in those 10 joke, days, in how, many boozy, was, yeah. how many boozy lunches did no, you have in those 10 days? There was a boozy lunch or two after, after. this was all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so same day you yeah. hear about the travel ban. How did you hear about the travel ban? It was um, Friday. The Thursday, I had been over there initially talking with Mr. McGann. And then Friday afternoon, I was back again. 
and it was late in the afternoon, and I was going back to Atlanta because my husband was going to be receiving an award and an event on Saturday night, and I'm in the car on the way to the airport, and I get a call from my principal deputy. I, I was able to keep one assistant with me. So, hey, did you know... Was it one of those calls? It was, Did you it know was, about this? He said, you know, after you left, I mean, it's kind of like the cat's away, so now he starts catching up on news and that stuff. He said, I went on the New York Times website, and I just read that President Trump has initiated some sort of travel ban directed at six Muslim-majority countries. I mean, we hadn't so, heard no, no, wait, anything Normal about course this. of yeah. things, the Attorney General would probably be apprised of yeah. a decision like this before it's made Public. Well, normal course of things, the attorney general would have an opportunity to have input say, Don't do this. <laughs> into a decision like this. And, and the main reason being that the Department of Justice is charged then with defending this. And in fact, we had to have lawyers in court the very next morning, Saturday morning, because there were people who were literally midair when the travel ban was wow. signed that then could not Couldn't come into in. the country. Because, you know, I know we, we've been through several iterations. This was travel ban one that I made my decision on that actually applied to green card holders, LPRs, lawful permanent residents, and to, to valid visa holders. And, and they were then being turned away. So, okay, so this is, this is a, a critical moment in the 10 days because this had happened, you hadn't been advised, you clearly didn't approve of it. Do you want to say why you didn't approve of it? Well, yeah, I mean, this was something from Friday, late Friday afternoon through to Monday. You know, we're trying to get our arms around what it is, what it is, yeah. you know, what they were trying to accomplish, what the parameters were. We're looking at legal challenges. Long story short, because I know you've got other panels you need to get to here, <laughs> called everybody in from the department, the Trump appointees and the career people to talk through um, how we would defend this. Um, both from a lawfulness standpoint, whether it was consistent with the Immigration Nationality Act, and from a constitutionality standpoint. And I, I can't go through the internal discussions of DOJ, I I'm sure you understand that, but I was not convinced at, at the end of this discussion that it was, in fact, okay. lawful or constitutional. So critical moment, because at that point, you do have a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the administration has done something that you cannot, in good faith, support, and right. you weren't given the opportunity to make that clear in advance. Right. There are two things you can do. One is, I'm out of here. I can't do this anymore. I can't do my job as the president's acting attorney general. Or two, what you did do, which is say, we're not going to do it. How, how did you make that decision? Yeah, and that was the quandary, actually. Um, and I'm sure it's not unlike probably high-stakes decisions that you all have made in your professions in a very compressed period of time. You don't do it just in those hours or, or couple of days that you have. You're drawing on your experiences and judgments from the prior 20 years that I've been at DOJ. But sort of bottom line, here's what it came down to. One option was, yeah, you're right, I could say, I'm out of here, you guys figure this out, I'm not going to be part of this. And I felt like that would have protected my personal integrity, but it would not have protected the integrity of the Department of Justice, because for us to advance a defense in this case, it would have required the Department of Justice to argue that religion had absolutely nothing to do with the travel ban, and that was something that I did not believe to be grounded in truth. And so, it felt like that would be the easy way out. And I actually thought back to my confirmation hearing when you know, there were several senators that were asking me if the president asks you to do something that's unlawful or unconstitutional, will you say no? They didn't ask me, will you resign? Hmm. They said, will you say no? So sort of, bottom line, I felt like I needed to do my job. And doing my job in this instance meant saying no. Uh and thus ended the 10 days. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, 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 and look, can I say one thing? Yes. I, I understand reasonable people may have different views of this. There can be folks out there that have a different view of the law, and I respect that, or people who might say, you know, she really should have resigned instead of directing, and I respect that too. But I think we all know, you know, I was sitting in the chair at that moment and had to make the decision I thought was the right one. Talk about the aftermath, because there are obviously bad things that happened. You were called a political hack. I'm sure the social media explosion was really uh, uh, nasty and unpleasant. On the other hand, you walk into a room of women like this, and they all stand up and applaud for you. Yeah. So good things, bad things. How, do you, how, how did you process that? Um, well, you know, when you're in the swirl of 
the events as they're going on. It's sort of hard, you don't really forecast what the ripple effects completely are gonna be as it, as it relates to that. I mean, certainly I knew that this was a consequential decision, but never expected the kind of reaction. And as I said, you know, there's certainly been some people who are critical and, and I respect those views, but what's been really humbling is you know, the, the folks that have been, you know, letters that I've gotten from young women around the country. One letter I got from a couple, a young couple, who had taken their little two-year-old son to the airport um, in the midst of travel ban one um, to meet people who were then coming off the plane, wow. holding up a sign that said, refugees welcome, because they said they wanted their son and the people who were coming to our country to know who we are and what we stand for. I mean, when you see that, and you see people who were volunteering to represent people, you know, in, in these days following that, you know, th those are folks that are really doing humbling work. Sally, you said you weren't political before this experience. I know some of those letters since the experience have urged you to become political uh, uh, and to make a run for office. Yeah. Is that something that you would consider? Now, look, I believe in public service. I wouldn't have stayed at DOJ as long as I did if I didn't believe in that. And, and hopefully someday I might have an opportunity for some type of public service again. But I gotta tell you, sort of running for office is just not anything that I have ever Doesn't felt sound like to. fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for being here with yeah. us today. Another round of applause, thank please. You. Thank you. Late last year, our next, oops, sorry, wait a minute, <laughs> wrong script. During Donald Trump's campaign for president, there were times at his rallies when he singled out one reporter for criticism. Our next guest, who covered the Trump campaign for NBC News and MSNBC, remembers those instances vividly, as well as being escorted to her car by the Secret Service. To share her experience, please welcome Katie Turr. Are we okay. here? Are we here? Yeah. I'm coming, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure which stage for a second. Welcome. Thank you very much. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So um, this is just gonna be a, a bunch of like, tell me about this, tell me about this questions because your sure. book is filled with such amazing and colorful and just so well to told anecdotes. But let's start with the context under which you became uh, the reporter on the Trump campaign. Um, it was a, a series of unfortunate events. Um, no, I was a, I was a London correspondent. Um, I lived overseas. I happened to be home um, to take care of a few things, to remind the bosses that I existed, because they tend to forget you when you're overseas. And uh, Donald Trump had just announced Macy's was dropping him, Univision was, uh, uh, Univision was dropping him, NBC dropped the pageant and they needed someone to cover it. And I was just literally standing around the newsroom and a friend of mine on Nightly News, Brad Jaffe, said, Katie's here, she can do the story. And I did a couple more stories, one for the Today Show, um, a couple more for Nightly, and after three or four days, I got a call from the president of the news division saying, hey, we're, we're gonna put you on the Trump campaign. And they said, don't worry, it'll just be six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And it turned into 510 days. Oh my gosh. And you actually um, took umbrage at that because you thought that meant that they didn't take you seriously. Well, yeah, because when you're, when you're covering politics, you know where you rank in the, in the structure of the company with who they assign you to. And if they're assigning you to Jeb Bush, you're doing well. If they assign you to Hillary Clinton, you're doing well. You're Andrea Mitchell. Um, if they assign you to somebody they don't expect to go anywhere and who many regard as a joke, you have to wonder, wait, hold on, am I a joke as well? And tell us what happened. You got in a car that day and drove to New Hampshire. Yeah, so I get in a car, I, I drive to New Hampshire um, from, from New York. Donald Trump's holding a rally around a backyard pool. It's like not these 10,000 person rallies that we got used to. It was a couple hundred people around a backyard pool at a private home and he's just riffing. He's kind of testing out the lines that became so well known and so popular later on in the campaign. And I, I'm 
I'm standing there and it's raining and I'm supposed to go on a vacation with my French boyfriend a week from then and I still hadn't told him that, oh, I'm, I'm not coming home for God knows how long. And thinking, what in the world am I doing here? What should, I? this guy's rambling on about, about the standing ovations he gets and he's talking about rapists coming across the border. <sighs> okay, I'll tweet what he's saying. I mean, I'm just taking notes. And suddenly I hear my name, and he is calling me out from the stage. The very first time I'd ever shared the same oxygen as Donald Trump, he's using me as his representation of why the media is unfair, is biased, and shouldn't be trusted. And what did he say? Is that when he called you little Katie for the no, first time? No, 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 that was no. a little, a little yeah. bit later on. Uh, no, he said, Katie, you, you haven't even looked up at me once. Basically, Katie, you ha you're not paying attention to me. And he knew that he knew that you were there. He knew that NBC was there, and yeah, he got he your knew, name somehow. I, he knew I was there. I, he knew that NBC had assigned me full time to the campaign. So it it gave him a sense, I presume, a sense of status, mm -hmm. because if NBC News is assigning you a full time correspondent for your presidential campaign, that does mean that we are taking you seriously. Right. Right, and then when was the first time he called you Little Katie? When was that? Little Katie was um, the day of the Muslim mm -hmm. ban, the day that he announced uh, that he wanted to close America's doors to everybody and what uh, happened there? of the Muslim religion. Um, it's, you gotta remember the context of, mm -hmm. of where we were in this country at that time. A, a few weeks earlier, around that time, uh, the, the couple in San Bernardino went and, and shot up a party, an office party. Um, the day before the Muslim ban announcement, President Obama had given a speech on terrorism. And Donald Trump, in order to be the most hardline and to be the guy that will keep you safe, comes out with this Muslim ban. And he had been saying, this administration is not properly vetting people. This administration is letting people through our borders that will harm you and your family. The majority of Republican voters at that time, the thing they most feared was being a victim of terrorism. And he said, essentially, the media is complicit in this because they're not reporting it. So we aren't keeping you safe. We, the media, reporters that are standing in this press pen, in this, in this, the belly of a warship where Donald Trump is holding a rally in South Carolina, these are the people who are not keeping you safe. And from the stage, everybody is, is riled up. They're, they're, they're whipped up into a frenzy. It, it's a cliche, but it feels like a tinderbox and you're just waiting for someone to light a match. And Donald Trump calls me out. He says, little Katie, Katie Turr, she's back there. And he points me out. And the entire room, thousands of people, turn around and, and boo at me at once, stand on their chairs, scream at me. And I remember thinking, what, what can you do in this situation? So I smiled. <laughs> and I waved because, uh, you know, I, at that point, <laughs> At that point, he had called me out so many times at rallies um, that I found that the best way to deal with it was to just pretend, not pretend like you're in on it, but, but you diffuse the situation by showing that you're not intimidated by it. Why, why do you think he targeted you? I mean, yes, he targeted others as well, but why do you think he was so... Uh, specifically targeting you? It's a complicated question, and I obviously cannot get into, you know, the, the mind and impulses, everyone at least, of Donald Trump, but um, I was the most familiar reporter to him on the campaign. I was there since essentially day one. There would be, um, there was a, a stretch of time, months-long stretch of time, where I was the only person he would recognize, other than his campaign staff, in a room uh, in Tennessee, in Grand Rapids, in, in Nevada, wherever he happened to be, I was the network news reporter that was always there with him before the other networks started assigning um, their own correspondents full time. So he knew that when he wanted to use the media as a foil, when he wanted to point somebody out, he knew that I was in the crowd. He always knew I was there. And also, I tended to report things that he didn't like. I was very honest about the campaign, uh, both with the support that he was getting, but with the, um, the anger that he was uh, creating and the untrue things 
he had a tendency to say. And how do you stay impartial under a context like that, when he's personally targeting you and when he's blaming your very profession for, for so many things? I, you just don't listen to it, it's noise. Mm -hmm. It's noise, you put it to the side, mm -hmm. and you keep doing your job. But the, the way that he targeted me in the media was um, enlightening, and it revealed a lot about how he was campaigning, and what he was trying to do, and what sort of um, uh, prejudices he was trying to exploit, how he was trying to paint himself. So you could use it to understand him better, but personal attack, no personal attack, you just, you treat it as noise. And you got death threats. Also noise. Also noise. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, you know, there has been some talk that, oh, the media, you know, played a role in helping elect Donald Trump, 1.9 or $2 billion in free advertising. What, what do you say to, to comments like that? Well, Donald Trump was unlike anything anyone had ever seen, um, and he was garnering a lot of attention. He was getting 20,000 20, people to show up at a rally in August of 2015 in Mobile, Alabama. This was at the time, at this time, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz were getting maybe a couple hundred people most of the time. And he was getting 20,000 mm -hmm. people. He got a lot of attention because he was getting a lot of attention from supporters. No one remembers anything like that for a Republican candidate, especially uh, six months before any primary. I think we all need to look back and see how we covered 2016 and how we can cover it better in 2020 and what did we do uh, that maybe went too far? Did we give him too much attention for these rallies? Should we have aired them as much as we did? I think that's a valid conversation. Um, did we talk enough to the voters or did we harp too much on a tweet? Um, I think those are, those are discussions that are worth having. I don't think it is right to say that the media elected Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We covered him pretty toughly. Yeah. And what did you learn from being so close to it? You know, so many people were so surprised when he won, but you weren't. I wasn't surprised only because he defied political gravity at every turn. Every time somebody said, oh, this was going to end him, he came out stronger. Um, and we would see such enthusiasm within these crowds, you knew that the people that showed up for a Trump rally, and sometimes they'd wait for hours in sub-zero temperatures or for hours in 90 plus degrees with 99% humidity on a Wednesday mid-afternoon. I mean, they were going to make sure that they got to the polls. There was no, oh, well, you know, I got work today and I, I don't think I can get there or my kid's sick. They would have walked through a hurricane and you said they actually, the you, you thought, you, one of the things you say in the book is that they made up their mind much earlier than most people. Yeah, look at the South Carolina thought. exit polls uh, during the primaries. Donald Trump, the, the majority of voters said that they decided that they were going to vote for him months and months prior. So back in December, back in November. So anything that we were reporting about him didn't really matter. They weren't paying attention. They may have been watching, they knew what was going on, but they didn't care because they already decided that Donald Trump was a person that they wanted in the White House because they were so sick of Washington. And there was also a sense that you will tell a pollster one thing because it was so, it was not, and I'm sure Kellyanne Conway will agree with this, it was not a, a popular thing for some people to say that yes, they like Donald Trump. But when you go into that polling booth, you're going to make the decision that maybe, you know, maybe to throw a bomb into it. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to tell anyone about it. You're right. not even going to tell the guy that calls you on the phone right. to ask you your opinion yeah. at home. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time, but does anyone have a question for Kelly Ann? I think we have one right here in the front row. Or for Katie. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you very much for all that you did on the reporting. Um, and you said the um, you, you said you know the media did not uh, elect Donald Trump. However, because he's such an anti-establishment um, figure in politics, it's almost like the the more negative coverage he got is the stronger his base grew. So yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, that's that's listen. I'm not the media is not trying to elect anybody or or unelect anybody. That's not our role. Our role is to tell you what is going on to contextualize the candidate, to fact check the candidate, to reveal as much as you can about this person so you can make the most informed decision that, that you can. Um, 
so if if the the fact checking only makes his base stronger, that's that's on his base. It's not really on us. We we do our jobs. Our jobs are to to dig, to hold a light up to who this person is, and to and to put them in context. Yeah. Uh, over here. Uh, wait for the mic, please. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. So you have done and seen it all. What advice would you give to the next round of presidential candidates to be a winner? Don't trust anything a politician or his staff says. <laughs> I mean, right. you, that's not our job. Don't trust anything anyone says. Make sure that you, that you get a second source on it. Make sure that you dig around on it. And also, uh, don't be quiet. Don't be intimidated. And then, what would you say to the next round of candidates? Candidates. Don't body slam us. <laughs> <laughs> um, just quickly, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Your parents were journalists also. Yeah. My parents were, were cowboys. Uh, they uh, were helicopter reporters in the, mostly in the 90s in Los Angeles. Uh, my dad flew the helicopter, and my mom hung out of the helicopter with a beta cam on her shoulder, a giant camera on her shoulder, and dangled out over the skids and shot fires, shot police pursuits. Uh, they found OJ in that slow speed pursuit. And they also um, did some spectacular uh, award-winning reporting uh, during the LA riots. My mom was hanging out of the helicopter while gang members were shooting up at the helicopter. They were, they were covering the beating of Reginald Denny, the guy that got pulled from the red gravel truck and beaten to within, inch, within an inch of his life. Um, so they did spectacular, ballsy things um, while I was growing up. And they got death threats for that because they had all of the, they covered, the, they showed the faces of the, of the would-be murderers. So this was in your, in your genes? Yeah, so I didn't realize, I, you said I got death threats in the campaign. I didn't really think about it in the moment. I just kind of put it to the side good at compartmentalizing. Mm -hmm. And I realized later that I probably didn't, it didn't bother me in the way that it should have bothered me because I was used to it. Mm -hmm. My dad slept with a gun under his pillow mm -hmm. um, while I was growing up. He had, a, he had a, um, a, a concealed weapons license because they got death threats. So it just felt like if you're gonna do important journalism, sometimes the price you pay is having to deal with crazy people trying to, or at least talking about killing you. Being fierce and being brave runs in your family. We're grateful for your time today. Congratulations so on your me. book. Thank Thanks. you, Katie. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. I think you can exit that way. There's stairs there. Oh, yeah. And now I'll introduce Katie. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Last year, our next guest became the first woman to run a successful presidential campaign. She started her career in politics over two decades ago with the polling company and woman trend that tracks social, cultural, financial, professional, and health trends affecting women. She resigned from her firm this year upon taking a post in the White House for President Trump. And a decade ago, she joined us on the summit stage for a conversation right before President Obama was elected. To share insights from her perspective inside the West Wing, please welcome Counselor to the President, Kellyanne Conway with Fortune's Patty Sellers. You. You're welcome. Welcome back, Kellyanne. Thank you. Kellyanne has been here a couple of times before, both here and in Laguna Niguel. Both here and in Laguna Niguel. Yes, yeah, so welcome back. Um, little did we imagine 10 years ago that we'd be talking to you in this context. So, counselor to the president, what have you learned is the best way to counsel President Trump? The best way to counsel President Trump is to be very honest and to very humbly but candidly offer my perspective and my advice, which has always been welcome. Um, from the moment that Donald Trump hired me to be the campaign manager, we were alone in the 26th floor. We had just um, finished a couple of meetings, and he was on his way to Altoona in Erie, Pennsylvania later that day, that morning. And we had a discussion, and he offered, we had a very candid discussion. I s said, we're losing. I've seen the polls, we're losing. If the election is about you, 
we have less of a chance of winning. If the election is about Hillary Clinton, you will win and how to turn that around. Um, and so I offer that advice very candidly, but very respectfully. I find that in employment situations, it's very important to assert yourself, but to also show a level of respect for hierarchy where it exists and for the classic employer-employee relationship. So I never, the last thing I said to Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, when he hired me as campaign manager was, I said, I wanna say one last thing. I, will, I don't address you by your first name and I don't consider myself your peer. That, and he said, okay, that allowed me to deliver tough news when I had to on the campaign trail and certainly um, what I would consider to be tough news in the White House as well. So, uh, but he is just somebody who's always surrounded himself with female employees and has elevated them to the highest levels of the Trump Corporation. Took a, took a chance on women in New York real estate when many men who were dominating industry would not, and he does the same thing in the West Wing. Tell, uh, give us an example of you counseling the president well in the White House as president recently. I can't share a lot of the pr private conversations, obviously, but anything that's you know more public, I would give. I give you a great example um, because I'm very involved in the opioid issue in the West Wing. Obviously, and yesterday was in West Virginia with our First Lady Melania Trump where we visited a really remarkable place called Lily's Place, um, one of the only uh, places of its kind in the country where they're helping the um, newborns that are born physically dependent on opioids. And it's obviously very sad, but to really raise the profile and help is a great deal. But we've been discussing, I've been um, speaking with the president very candidly about drug demand reduction, but also drug <laughs> supply reduction that you see in many of our communities, we actually have a fentanyl problem where these teenagers and college students are dying like that because they're buying a pill for $5, really for the cost of a latte. These kids who won't put a french fry or a piece of bread in their mouth are buying a pill for $5, and I want them to hear me and to say, please don't do that. You don't know what's in it. And so having a candid conversation about perhaps how we can as a nation um, Raise what did awareness, you say but also to the president? Pressure. Well, I can't tell you that, but I well, think you're going to see you're some real policy. Well, you're bringing up this example, but what, um, uh, give us an example of your influence in this situation. It, my influence in this situation is I think that we have to be very aware that most of the fentanyl is coming in from China and that we've got a great relationship now with President Xi, a much stronger relationship than has been in the past due in large part to this president and his team. And uh, we've got beef and dairy going to China, for example, for the first time in, I think, 14 or 15 years in this country. And so if we are looking at cracking down on not having fentanyl come into our communities and literally poisoning and killing um, our youth and others, then we have to have a very candid conversation with those who are supplying it. Um, so, so there's that. I've been involved in everything from tax reform to health care reform to a number of different issues. And also, you know, I'm a pollster by trade. That's why I was invited, I think, previously to your, to your panels. I owned a company called The Polling Company and Woman Trend. And uh, I'm very candid about the polling data, but also, just as I was during the campaign, I tried to show the president, as I did the candidate, different aspects of the country situationally and attitudinally that I think is often missed in the polling data. What is your to the extent that you can share with us um, the way you counsel the president, how do you talk with him about his tweeting? It depends on the, it depends on the tweets. First of all, I think he still has his natural connective tissue with people. And uh, now more than ever, the ability to go around uh, some folks who don't cover a lot of what is good for this country. We've refused to cover the fact that the stock market is up 25%. It's had 44 record highs last count, maybe even more now, that he is trying to pass a middle class tax cut so that you can give this country a pay raise. And we're trying to connect the 6 million unfilled jobs with the 6 million people looking for work. We're trying to put them together. Um, the idea that he wants to reform health care for the 29 million or so Americans. And he can so tweet Americans. about all those things. But he does, and he covers it. He tweeted about that this morning, actually, and I bet it hasn't been covered. We've done a content analysis where, uh, if, I think in June I asked for a content analysis. There were 180 presidential tweets, and most of them were about policy or events 
or statements or executive orders or pieces of legislation or trying to push the vote on something one way or the other, but that gets far less coverage than some of the others. Are you not concerned that his tweeting is adding to um, division and um, rancor? What I'm concerned about is that this president, and I hear this from people who did not vote for him, and from people who, um, people who don't always cover him fully and fairly either, but there is a concern that they literally have never seen a president covered this way. The words that are used to describe the, and I'm, I'm the person in the West Wing who's actually never uttered the words fake news, enemy of the people, opposition party, I don't speak that way, I think we need a full and free press in our nation, of course, uh, in a full democracy. But with, with that freedom comes responsibility. So my grievance is never um, about fake news. My, I've, I talk about incomplete coverage. I talk about You've us not connecting. You've never used the term fake news, except in this conversation. And I understand in the context of talking about the topic of fake news, you have never said I don't speak that way. What I talk about is incomplete coverage because I think that we are in a position, everyone in this room is in a position to connect America and particularly America's women with the information they need. So if you don't know the six or seven major measures that the president has put into law in his short time in office that have improved the lives of our veterans, the VA Choice Act that where veterans who cannot access quality and timely care through the VA, which most veterans say they can, have the opportunity to go to private care now and do that. The Whistleblower Protection Act, the 24-7 hotline at the White House for veterans that was never had before, where they can call and access information, access services. So if you've heard about that for the first time today, it means that that's incomplete coverage. The, the, the many different- Do you counsel the president in terms of his use of that term, fake news? The president, is trying to improve the lives of Americans, made a lot of sacrifices to be there. And he's got real news going on every day that doesn't get covered. But look, I think the best attribute I bring to my job is humility. Because I don't know how you can function in, in jobs like this um, without it. There's a certain grace and humility that is expected, I believe, in positions like this, that with the gravity and responsibility comes a certain humility. So I walk through the doors of the White House every single day, having been raised by a single mom without money growing up. I never knew that because nobody, they never talked to kids about adult problems. And I am very, very, feel very beholden to the forgotten men and forgotten women who helped elect this president, who feel like he is giving voice and visibility. And if I can be one small molecule in pushing that forward, then I'm going to make the family sacrifices and the money sacrifices that we made to do that. Who has questions? Uh, okay, uh, is there a question back here? Yes. Yeah, Michal Avram with Fortune. Um, you and President Trump have repeatedly talked about immigrants as criminals, and yet statistics show that um, immigrants, both documented and undocumented, are less likely to commit crimes than people born here in this country. You've also talked about them in the context of taking jobs from people who are born here. And I'd like to point out that the most entrepreneurial demographic is foreign born. So can you please explain what good the restrictions that you're proposing on immigration, the anti-immigration uh, rhetoric that you've put forward does other than foment division in our country? Right. So there's an information. That's your perspective, and the fact is the president just put forward a 70-point immigration plan. I would commend everybody to look at it. It's very transparent for everyone to see. We're very happy that Leader Schumer and Leader Pelosi at least came to the White House and said that they're willing to talk about immigration reform. That includes DACA, and it goes way beyond that. The fact is that there are many Americans who are out of work, who are looking, to, looking for jobs, and this, this president has made a commitment to make sure that the law is enforced. This president, in his immigration reform plan, is talking about 1,000 more ICE agents at the border because we hear from those at the border that they simply don't have the resources to meet the demand at the border. We want to make sure that the unaccompanied minors are, are cared for and are returned safely to their home countries. We want to make sure that the 300 new immigration judges that the president has in his plan um, come forward because they too tell us there's such a backlog in cases that they can't keep up. 
it's, it's not a lot to expect people to obey the laws. You talk about, this president's talked about sanctuary cities. He is basically saying if you want a grant, a federal grant, if you want money from Department of Homeland Security or Department of Justice, you must comply with the federal laws. And many state, many cities, and now the entire state of California has said no to that. So they risk losing those grants for the rest of their citizenry as well. But I find it very elitist and arrogant when people say, and plenty of Republicans and Democrats have said the following, that illegal immigrants are here to do the jobs Americans don't want to do. That's really fair when I personally know people that are looking for jobs and are willing to do jobs, but they can't take $6 under the table an hour. They can't do that. And they, they, they want high paying jobs. We also want to make sure that American employers um, are being held to account. So E-Verify is, is in the 70 point plan. Again, you can read it. Uh, it's in the 70 point plan as well. So uh, we, I think casting it that way is not having a very meaningful conversation about the gaps in the system. Nobody can deny that, nobody can deny that in some cases, uh, folks who have been deported and committed crimes many times, like Kate Steinle's murder, she should be a household name, and nobody wants to make her that. I've met face-to-face, -face, shoulder to shoulder, with the parents of children who were killed, or in some cases murdered, by those who had been deported and those had been, who should not have been here and who had committed crimes. That's not everybody, that's not most of them. But to deny that is to deny the grief of those, of those families, and it's to not deny us coming together to have a better system. The, the idea that we have 30,000 unaccompanied minors here and everybody is okay with that doesn't seem right. I wanna ask another question about immigration. As a pollster, uh, many people say that you laid the groundwork, you provided sort of the intellectual infrastructure for the immigration thinking um, that led to um, both led to the election of President Trump and has served to fracture the Republican Party. Do you agree with that, that you significantly laid the groundwork? The Republican Party is fractured. I don't know, they've won 1,000 elected offices uh, for the eight years President Obama was there. Well, there's Excuse a lot me, of disagreement. Well, that's a fact. The... Nine, 938 state legislative seats control the House, control the Senate, and indeed the White House. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's unignorable, okay. and it should be stated. So I'm not sure the Republican Party is fractured. I okay. think the Democratic Party is bereft of any new messages, which is why There's a lot struggling. of disagreement. Okay, the disagreement within uh, the Republican Party well, about the future of the party, do you feel that you re contributed to that as a pollster? Maybe it's an okay thing. I'm very happy to have tapped, to have recognized what people were thinking about this issue. You know, Donald Trump took the issues of immigration and trade, which immigration was probably at 3% in the polls. Most important issue, trade, wasn't even asked in most polls. It was an asterisk, if you will, less than 1%. He took these issues that weren't popping in the polls, and he, put the, he talked about them in terms of fairness. He talked about, yes, we want trade deals, but they should stop screwing America. They should be more fair to us and our workers and our employers who are being punished for employing people here. They're being punished for trying to bring those profits back to this country. They're being incentivized to ship the wealth and the jobs overseas, which is why his tax plan would repatriate, deem repatriation of 10% and then repatriate some of that $2.8 trillion that's legally parked overseas. And so he talked about it through the lens of fairness. He talked about it through the lens of how we want to make sure we're also protecting the American worker, American communities, American jobs. And in that way, we, we tapped into the fact that many Americans saw immigration as an economic issue and as an issue of fairness to them. And yes, and that got Donald Trump, Donald J. Trump elected. I think and he got himself elected. I get well, a lot of and credit and I immediately share it. And and you we had a great you team, helped a him in a big team. way, Kellyanne. Do you worry do you worry about the let's let's leave out the word fracture. Do you worry about the division in the Republican Party and do you worry that it will provide uh, an opportunity for the Democrats in 2018. So I don't do politics in the White House. I certainly, you know, we don't do, we can't do, I can't talk about races, et cetera. So to the extent I could talk about a party, 
I'll talk about both of them, to be fair. Even though you didn't ask about the um, Democratic Party and its fracturing. I don't, I don't even know who the leader of the Democratic Party is. Is it Tom Perez, who's the leader of the DNC? Is it Bernie Sanders, who seems to get a lot of support? Um, won 13 million voters in 22 primaries against Hillary Clinton. Is it Hillary Clinton, who's still out there talking? Is it President Obama? Is, I don't know who the leader of the Democratic Party is. Is it Elizabeth Warren? Is it all the people already running in 2020 who really haven't done much in 2017? So in terms of the Republican Party, I'm glad that that party welcomes a diversity of viewpoints on any number of issues. You call it fracturing it. Fracturing, they, they refer to it as welcoming a diversity of viewpoints on any number of issues. So we have um, of our, say, the, say the Republican female senators, for example, there are many more Democratic female senator, senators, but they all have one view on a fracturing issue like abortion. In the, the Republican female senators, we have pro-lifers and, pro, and pro-choicers. Mm -hmm. That's a party that welcomes different points of view on any hot button issues of the day, like abortion or immigration or tax reform. And I frankly think that's why they become the majority party. It's why they have a majority of the governorships and the state legislative chambers, and now the House, Senate, and yes, the White House, because at least you feel that your, your, your different viewpoints are welcome and reflected in the party. But we, you know, we also, yes, sure. Another question. Okay, back here, we have a question. Uh -huh. Hi, um, Moj Madera from BeautyCon Media. I just have two questions. Um, can I get your thoughts on the Charlottesville many fine people on both sides comment? I'm curious to know what you think of that. And then I'm also super curious to know uh, Robert Mercer, Cambridge Analytica, uh, their involvement in Brexit, and uh, of course I'm sure you're familiar with what they did here. Curious to know what you think of that investigation and what the American public should know about that. What investigation? About Russia, about Cambridge Analytica, about Robert Mercer, about bots, about fake news, about all the fake accounts. It's a very big question. Well, I'm sorry. What, take take the first one. I have a minute. Um, <laughs> in terms, well, I'm not, well, not going to let her besmirch, you know, a private citizen. Uh, lots of people are under investigation, like Bob Menendez, a Democratic senator in New Jersey. Nobody wants to cover it. He's a criminal defendant in a felony trial. But Bob Mercer and Cambridge Analytica. I'd love to know what you what what involvement do they have with your campaign? So data, and Brexit no. and everything else, going the on and retargeting on. of Project Alamo and all the things that we're currently so I can talk about. about I can talk about the value of data in our campaign through Cambridge Analytica. Brad Parscale was our digital director, and he was on 60 Minutes this past Sunday, and I think treated the country to something they may not have known, which is at the Trump campaign, we did 50% TV ads and 50% online ads. It was a big risk that was taken, and people were really surprised that the Trump campaign was a bigger Google customer and Facebook customer some weeks than the Hillary Clinton campaign because she obviously had so much more money and a lot more personnel. And the reason that we did that was um, we saw a shift in the, in, the in the electorate, and we looked at them as consumers. How are they getting their information? So if you're, already, if you're already relying upon social media, or you're already relying upon direct text messaging to receive and convey information, then why not apply that plumbing to your political information? And it turns out that that was a gamble that paid off because um, that is where people were digesting a great deal of information. The traditional TV ad is important, but not as important. So in that regard, and I know Bob Mercer, very well, and he's a great patriot, and he's a very humble person who invests in causes in which he believes. Um, uh, he's just been much more successful at it than others. I'm not aware of, of the other things that you're talking about um, in terms of investigation, but I do think that data like that is the way of the future. Kellyanne, what is power? I'm just glad you asked, because I've, I've, talked, I've thought about that for a very long time. Uh, I believe that women in power particularly have a certain responsibility to define it and to harness it for the greater good. And I do try to do that every day. I don't necessarily feel powerful, but I do feel empowered um, to help make change. I was, I mean, power for me means that I'm a product of my choices, not a victim of my circumstances. It means that I am become very impervious to the naysayers and critics. And, and I think that's important. It also means that I am trying to really navigate the, uh, like millions of American women are trying to navigate, 
the equilibrium between raising four school-age children and having um, a very busy job and the responsibilities on my, sh my shoulders that I do. But I, feel, I don't feel burdened at all. I feel blessed. And I feel like if we look at power as the ability to effectuate change and to make our own choices, um, then I'm comfortable with that. But I feel that, I, I feel that there are so many women in this country that don't have the blessings that I have and the privileges I have that don't, that haven't been given their shot, that have worked just as hard as I've worked, but never really get that shot. When I went on Rachel Maddow's show a year ago, and she just won the Emmy for that interview, I'm very happy for her, uh, that, I said to you, she said, well, congratulations. And I said, you know, Rachel, I used to watch you as a panelist on Tucker Carlson. You had a show on MSNBC years ago. And I used to say, she's very smart. She's very intuitive. She always has something fresh and new to say, even when I don't agree with it. And I said, the difference between you and me is we got our shot. There are a lot of talented, intelligent women who work incredibly hard, but they don't get that opportunity. And so if I can be in any position to do that, if I, at the end of my tenure at the White House, can say fewer people are dying of opioid overdoses or more military spouses, which are 92% female and predominantly are raising children, so they're effectively single moms when he's over de being deployed, if more of them can be connected with employment because they're underemployed and unemployed compared to the civilians in their different industries, if more Americans have health insurance, if people are, if entrepreneurs are, feel more comfortable to build a business like I did out of nothing, then I will feel like that work was done. And I don't think power, I, th I think we're all free to criticize e each other's choices and how we look and how we speak, but I don't find that very empowering to other women. And so I'm trying to teach my daughters who had to grow up super fast because of the way their mother is sometimes treated that that's not power, that's not exercising power. I think respectful disagreement is the best way that I can exercise that power, humbly but forcefully. And I just remember what Margaret Thatcher said. She has a famous phrase, being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to say you are, then you probably are not. So there's something to quiet power. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, just stay in the room, please. Um, and I just want to make a point that uh, I'd like Lee Gallagher to come up and Nina Easton and Michal Levram. Uh, please come up to the stage. I'd like to make a, a quick observation. When we started Most Powerful Women in 1998, most of the women who came to this conference and were on our most powerful women list asked me, I got the question so many times, I wish you'd change the name of this. N women didn't like, powerful women didn't like the word power. And I think we're all embracing it now and we're all defining it for ourselves and that is a very, very healthy thing. So thank you for coming along that road with us. Um, so, I'd like to thank Lee, Nina, Michal. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for uh, the team at Fortune, uh, the head of programming, Lisa Klukas, Delwyn Gray, who puts on the, the master of logistics, who ex uh, executive produces this, and, and their teams, and John Needham Partners. And um, we would like, again, to thank our generous sponsors. Our global most powerful women partner, Johnson & Johnson. Our global finance partner, Royal Bank of Canada. Deloitte, hosting the leadership track. Insignium, growth and leadership track. Salesforce, ideas that change the world track. Our gold sponsors, Guardian, Hydric and Struggles, Herman Miller, Toyota, TPG. Silver sponsors, New York Stock Exchange, Shiseido, Target. Artemis Rising Foundation, bronze sponsors, Artemis Rising Foundation, Google, United Therapeutics, and UPS. Thank you, sponsors. <laughs> Nina. I, was supposed to read well, I, I, I don't have a lot to say, so I actually memorized it. <laughs> um, we, I just want to I'm remind sorry. you all that we are not a conference. As you know, I, you, if it's your first time here, you realize we're a community, and that's what we're all about. Um, so this continues not only with our signature event next year, which will be in Laguna, correct? Mm -hmm. um, it also continues with dinners throughout the year. 
it continues with our next gen conference and please please think, keep us in mind when you want to nominate a rising star that should come to our next gen conference and please don't forget that we have our conference in our summit i should say in uh, london this coming june thank you so much so next year we will be returning to Laguna Niguel, yay, California. Mark your calendars for October 1st through 3rd, 2018 at the Ritz-Carlton in Laguna Niguel. Um, don't forget to consider nominations for our fourth annual Most Powerful Women Next Gen Summit. Um, this is going to take place next month, November 13th through 14th at the Monarch Beach Resort in Laguna Niguel, California. We hope you'll join the Fortune Next Gen community for this unparalleled opportunity to connect with an extraordinary group of your peers. Um, thank you all and safe travels. Thank you. Spread the power. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you Thanks guys. For staying. Thank you for staying.